Welcome back to another episode of HBP, the Hoops Prospects Podcast. Uh, we didn't have a show last week due to multiple illnesses. Uh, hopefully you had a chance to listen to our last episode. Uh, we discussed some of the more mysterious players in this draft class, and our special guest was Santa Clara, Santa Clara guard Jalen Williams, who was one of the top performers at the NBA Combine. Um, if you haven't checked out that episode already, please be sure to do so on hppod.buzzsprout.com or any of the major podcast outlets, including Apple and Spotify. My name is Richard Harris, and I am joined by fellow HP analyst Drew Barton. Uh, due to the holiday and lack of bail funds, Hugh Baxter, <laughs> Connor uh, Youngberg are not with us today. Um, but with all the combines now completed, we're going to focus on whose draft stock has dramatically changed, either positively or negatively. And our special guest will be Mark, Marco Zarkovich, uh, the head coach of Telecom Baskets Bond 2 in Germany. Drew, how are you doing today? Rich, I am doing very well. Uh, just graduated last Saturday. Um, got to celebrate this past weekend with my girlfriend at the Ball Rock uh, Music Festival. So I'm doing very well. Um, I know why he's not here. He's just running from me and his maverick slander. He just doesn't want to hear doesn't want to hear me um, talk about how my Golden State Warriors destroyed his Dallas Mavs, but I am doing very well. Okay. Uh, who was at the festival? Anybody uh, else know? Or anybody? Uh, any yeah, so it was three days. Um, we went last year, so we followed up this year. Uh, the big headliners were Metallica, oh. uh, put on a hell of a, hell of a show. Uh, Pink was there. Uh, a couple of younger uh, artists, maybe you might not be familiar with the Twenty One Pilots, um, who are who are good. Uh, Luke Combs is a big country guy. I I'm not into country, so um, he kind of just went over my head. But there were there were some really good bands. Even some of the smaller acts were pretty cool. Black the Black Crows were there. Oh. Uh, they put on a good show. So it was it was overall a pr pretty solid weekend. It was just hot. So I, I spent I most really of the day drinking wine and watching music. Nice. I really enjoy the Black Crows. Um, yeah, they were good. Okay, so it's very eclectic then. Oh, absolutely. Okay. All right, so as always, we'll start off by talking about uh, the NBA, and you mentioned uh, your Warriors uh, putting their foot down on top of the Mavs. Uh, what, are you, what are your thoughts about what transpired um, throughout, you know, the uh, conference finals? Yeah, so I think, I mean, we'll start with the West, because obviously that was my team and my pick, the Warriors. Um you know, I, I have a lot of love for Luca, and I think the Mavs do have some really great pieces. I think Brunson has is ascending and reaching a level that I, I thought he was going to be a really good player. I didn't see him being possibly, you know, the second or third best player on a conference championship level team. So I think the Mavs have a good squad, but I think there was a bit of an overreaction. And this has been the case for the entirety of this playoffs because there's been so many blowouts um, yeah. that the Mavs dismantled the Suns and – everybody flipped their narrative to the Mavs are the team to beat. Look what they just did to the Suns. And when you look at that series, the average margin of victory was almost 17, 18 points per game. And every team had only had defended home court, never won on the road. So it was a very abnormal series where everybody was just blowing each other out. It's, you know, one game that just went really wild, in my opinion. And so I think the Warriors personally just were the better team. I, I didn't really understand the hatred that guys like Wiggins, we're getting in terms of like, oh, he can't do anything with Luca. Yeah, nobody can, but Wiggins isn't a complete scrub. He was the number one overall pick to, for some reason. Um, and, you know, I just think Hugh had mentioned that he wanted to see guys like Wiggins, you know, step up in a big playoff game. And my counterpoint was, well, I want to see Dorian Finney-Smith step up in a big playoff game and Reggie Bullock. The Warriors have been there, and I'll trust my core of Steph, Clay, Draymond over Luca. And at the end of the day, the Mavs play relative small ball where everyone's roughly the same height, switches everything, spreads the court and shoots. The team that, you know, invented that, made that popular was the Warriors with a relatively similar core. So I'm not too shocked that that series went the way it did. I picked, I said Warriors in six, Warriors in five just helped lower my blood pressure a little bit, made me stress a little bit less. Right, right. And the rest of us went with Dallas, but I admitted that I was only doing that just because I wanted to see, you know, some new blood in the finals. Absolutely. Um, yeah, you know, I, I actually thought the Warriors would win it, but, uh, you know, one thing that surprised me was, well, actually two things, uh, Looney stepping up absolutely, and, and Jason Kidd not having, not countering that anything, 
Nothing. He did the Nothing same thing him. every game. He had the yep. same, same thing. And I, correct me if I'm wrong, but wasn't he kind of criticizing Milwaukee for being stubborn and 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 in Brooklyn when he was when he was with the Nets? And I think the cover up in Brooklyn was the team at the time wasn't super talented, so he was just trying to make it work with what he had. Right. But same thing with Milwaukee. I mean, Giannis hadn't ascended yet. Middleton hadn't ascended yet. But yeah, I just was. For Kevon Looney to be such an X factor to the point where I mean we were joking in our in our group chat about you know he's going to win the the conference finals MVP, but I mean he was an absolute factor to the level I didn't think he would be. I thought him and Dwight Powell same thing they'd play 10, 12 minutes a game each and right, have a couple right, points, right. couple rebounds. I thought they cancel each other out. Right, exactly, exactly. And and one thing I kept on thinking was you know hell put Boban in, just put just do something to change it up. And different. <laughs> something different and he never did and you know and on the other side you have a guy who you never know who's going to come off the bench you know oh, yeah you know is it going to be moody tonight is is, is it going to be uh you name it you know um you know the different options that they have on the bench lee um who's the other rookie i'm drawing a blank the kaminga uh, yeah kaminga um <laughs> You know, and all all these guys, uh, you know, he, he he uses them when he feels, you know, that their particular skill set might give them a spark at that yeah. particular time. Jason Absolutely. Kidd, Jason Kidd didn't do anything like that, yeah. and um, yeah, uh, and I'll tell you what, you know, I think we're seeing well, another thing we're seeing. I think in both conference finals is small ball can only go so far, you know, yeah. and and I think you you know, and this is that's what's going to make the championship final interesting because Boston doesn't play small ball. They're huge. Uh, they are huge. Right. I mean, they put Al Horford <laughs> at the four. You know, and um, so yeah. So let, moving on to the East, um, you know, a lot of those games weren't competitive either, and, yeah. and that that was all. That was very disappointing. You know, Absolutely. it's just you know, I I thought. I thought every one of those games between Miami and Boston were going to go down to the wire, you know, and, um, and, uh, you know, there was something off last night. What was it? You know, was it too, was it too many fouls? Was it, was it too physical? I mean, there's just something that didn't. Yeah, I don't know. I was going to say the same thing. It's just, you know, I was, I was following the game cause I was still, I was coming back from this festival or, or we were getting ready to leave. And so I was, I was following the game and I believe the final score was 196. Yeah. Okay. And I, you know, at first, as I was looking, I was like, oh, okay, um, you know, these are two kind of gritty teams. They pride themselves on defense. But then just kind of looking, I was, other than Jimmy Butler, I don't think anyone really dominated for the, no one did anything for the Heat other than him. Uh, Bam played pretty well, actually. Um, I don't know. I, it just felt that the entire series, I thought it'd be nitty and gritty down to the wire. And instead, it was just, gritty but neither team really was able to do anything like it, like you said rich you hit it out. it was nothing was close i mean last night was probably the best game in the series maybe game one when the heat came back because everything else was 10 12 15 point leads the whole way through and you know the heat the heat were horrible it was just jimmy jimmy butler's gonna score 40 or we're gonna lose right <laughs> and then and then boston statistically you look oh they stay you know they played well in terms of points, rebounds, and assists, but they look at field goal percentages, turnovers. I mean, there were games where yeah. I was like, Jalen Brown was an NBA All-Star a year ago and is going to be a huge piece in their title run and has been. And he looked like he couldn't even dribble the basketball sometimes. Tatum, too. Yeah, Tatum, and I'm like, Tatum, these are – Tatum was a turnover yeah. machine. So it was just really disappointing. And, and to be honest, this is why, you know, if we talk predictions, I still give it to the Warriors because the Warriors are going to have a game in every series where – Steph is awful. They turn the ball over. Clay can't do anything. Draymond gets thrown out, and you're going to beat them by 20. It's it's literally happened in every – if you look at every series with the exception of against the Nuggets because they were just – they were so much better. The, they they had a game where they got embarrassed, whether it was on the road or at home, but they still won the series. And it's because I think there is something to be said about championship DNA. It's a bit cliched. But if Boston thinks that they're going to be able to run around, turn the ball over, be loose with the handle, Steph Curry, Clay, Tom, these guys can get hot. And bury you by thirty in your gym at their gym. It doesn't matter. I don't think you know. I think the Heat didn't have that ability. Like the Heat can turn you over, and then it's just Kyle Lowry who then can't even get up and down the court 
I don't know. It was a disappointing series. I, I it yeah. really bothered me. And of me. course, injury injuries mucked it all up too. Oh, I know. I mean, at on one both point, sides, on both sides. Yeah. I, I don't think Robert Williams last night was healthy at all. You know, he didn't oh, do no. much at all. Oh, if, if that was a game six, he wouldn't have played. If that was a game six, he wouldn't. They wouldn't have. If they were facing elimination in a game six, maybe. But if that was, he wouldn't have played. If that was a game six, and. I, it sucks because at one point, I think the Heat's entire starting five plus hero was listed as questionable in one game. And then obviously Robert Williams was out. And I know Smart, I mean, I know health matters, but I think the nice thing about that series was, as I do feel that it showed that there are teams out there and players out there that kind of have that old school mentality in them that will kind of grit it out. We live in the era of, you know, got to rest, got to rest and got to, you know, <laughs> what is it? Load management. It's like, there is no load management because if I lose, all I'm going to be doing for the next six months is load managing. So maybe I should get out there. So, you know, I think it's going to be a fun series. Um, I was saying this as a Warriors fan. I was telling my girlfriend and all these other people, I'm scared of the Celtics just because they are so big. And even though the Grizzlies were the best rebound team in the in the league, I felt that that was more of just kind of a the regular season thing, like size in the playoffs. They, they Celtics are legitimately huge, one through five, and then onto the bench. So, and I think small ball, the evolution of that too. I think you said small ball has its limits. It's because when small ball first started, it was guards generating all the offense. Now you have guys, the next evolution is now small ball is a 6'10 guy, 6'9 guy like Tatum putting the ball on the deck and shooting a fall away three. So it's still small, but it's not really small ball anymore. It's more skilled ball. Right. And the Warriors don't have a guy like that. Their they're most skilled players are all 6'3", 6'4". Yeah, well, I mean, Wiggins is... Wiggins he's six seven, yeah. but he's a little bit light though. Like he's a little bit slight. Right. I feel like in terms right. of the weight, like you know, I, I could see a guy like Tatum, Horford. Those guys could be trouble for him in terms of, you know, if he has to play a small ball four. I think Al Horford is definitely <laughs> gotten by a few pounds. Yeah. So yeah. you know, we'll, we'll see. I, I think it'll be a good series though. I'm taking the Warriors in. I'll say Warriors in uh, in six. I'll stick with that projection. We should have got the gangs, the the rest of the gangs picks, but. Uh... They're all going to say Celtics. He's going to say Celtics in two, <laughs> despite me. He will tell me Celtics in two, just despite me. Hugh, I love you, but just so you know, Mavs in nine, baby. <laughs> uh, I'll take Boston in seven. And this one, you know, unlike when I went with Dallas, this one I feel like it, I really do think it's pretty much a toss-up. Though I was – you know, Boston's turnovers, Boston's silly fouls. Um, yeah, the, the, and 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 I think a lot of it, you know, a lot of those turnovers are a result of playing too much iso ball. Absolutely. Um, and not moving the ball enough. Marcus and, Smart kills me sometimes. He, he does he too, right? He, yeah. he kills I mean, me sometimes. I mean, I Miami, Miami let him shoot. Yeah, Miami they let him do let him they, shoot. Yeah. You know, and sometimes he came through, and a lot of times he didn't. Yeah. So I assume Golden State's going to let him shoot too. <laughs> that, and that's that's my you know my final point on the Warriors why they're so hard to pick against is because just as they'll have a, a letdown game, I'm pretty confident that the Warriors are the type of team that you can pencil in one or two victories in almost any series just because of the shooting and the veteran. Right. So it's right. you're looking at this series, and and I, I don't know your opinion. I, you know, I, I go back and forth with a lot of people on this that in most series, I think. The Warriors will win two games in any series against any opponent in the NBA this year. They can win one at home. They can win on your place. They, and that makes them so difficult because you, for the most part, I think have to know that, okay, this series is probably going six minimum. Even if we get them down, it right, might go right, six right. just because of their ability. So that's why I picked the Warriors because I just – I don't see a world where for four games they aren't able to score 135 and beat you. Well – I guess where I'm going with this is I, I I go back to the previous series and I'm saying what what would have happened if Dallas would have actually been able to get some rebounds? <laughs> yeah. Oh yeah. And so and so I'm thinking you know Boston's not shouldn't have that issue, and so that's where I think it makes it interesting. Um, so I'll go with Boston. I'll take them in seven. And I, I'll go on record saying I'm not doing that just because I'm, root, you know, rooting for someone new to win it. No, I, I actually think they have a legitimate shot. I, Absolutely. You know, if if I had to bet, you know, if I had to bet my house on it, I, I'd probably, you know, probably take Golden State. Um, but it wouldn't be an easy decision. Yeah, I, I think I say six. But if this goes seven, if this goes seven games and Boston wins on a, a final shot kind of situation, I 
I wouldn't be shocked. They have the talent. It's just they have a young, you know, first year head coach. And I love Udoka as a head coach. He has turned that team around from where they were at the halfway point in the season right. where they were talking about trading away smart and getting right. like not signing Jalen to like being in the finals. And I believe they are the betting favorite. I could be wrong. It's close. Are they? I, are they? I, I think they might be the betting favorite. Um hmm. I, I could be wrong, but I'm pretty sure I was reading something on so it's so even Twitter. so it's that close. Okay. It, it, it's close though. So good. um I, I think it'll be a good series. And and I do like Boston. I always Jason Tatum is probably my favorite player to ever come out of Duke, at least in my era of basketball. Like I just I've always liked this game. I like Udoka. I'm I'm really happy for guys like Al Horford who have just mm. been such great competitors. Yeah. And I believe, you know. Guys, like, I don't, I'm not the type of person who thinks, like, with Chris Paul, like, oh, he deserves a ring. I think you deserve a ring. You need to go win the ring. You don't, I can't just say that. <laughs> right. But he's the type of guy that, like, seeing Al Horford win a ring, I, I, I wouldn't have an issue with that. I could get behind that. But yeah. with that being said, I want to go to a parade. It's been nice <laughs> in the area. So I want to, I want to go to a parade. <laughs> All righty. Um, so should, uh, should we move on to talk about the combines and, uh, who's, who's rising and falling? Um, I don't know. Uh, I guess we'll. We, what we did here is uh, we kind of compiled a uh, rather comprehensive list of people who we think improved their stock, and uh, people who didn't it went the opposite direction. Uh, first guy on our list is uh, Jake Laravia. Now Jake didn't play, um, but uh, you know, you know, one of the funny things about Laravia is there was like his age depending on what website you went to they had it he was anywhere from 23 to 21 but he was never 20 and um i don't know who finally got it right i wrote to wake forest they gave me the wrong birthday they gave they they told me he was 20 he's right now he's like 20 and a half they told me at the time that he was 21 you know a few months ago Jeez. so they had the right day they had the right day a month, but they had wrong year. Um, so I had been going. So now you find out that this guy's only 20 years old. And you throw in, he's, you know, Mr. Do Everything. And yeah. what he did positively, even though he didn't play at the combine, he, he participated in the shooting drills. He did very well. Um, and uh, he also tested out athletically very well for a 6'8 guy. And... Um, you know, this is, like I said, this is a guy who can score inside and out. Uh, he can pass. He can play defense. Uh, one of my favorite stats about him uh, this year as a forward, as a forward, he was at the 96th percentile for uh, points plus assists per possession. So uh, Jake has definitely solidly now moved up into the first round range for us. Um, any thoughts on him? Yeah, I you know, you look at him, he's like a little bit of an unassuming guy. And maybe that's because we thought he was 23. And I guess, I guess <laughs> when he's not. Um, but I really thought when I followed Wake Forest throughout the year it was more because of Alondis Williams, who, if I'm not mistaken, was the ACC player of the year. Yes. Um, and, yes. and his and his his story is really cool. But LaRavia, in my opinion, is probably, well, I don't think probably is more built for the NBA game. Um, like you said, I think Mr. Drew Everything's a really good um moniker for him one thing i liked about jake not combine related but in his season is in his three years he got better in every aspect of his game somehow and that to me kind of speaks volumes as he was taking on more responsibility he was rising to that shooting percentage got better three-point percentage got markedly better um i love the passing he did have his turnovers were relatively high for a forward which but he was also doing more playmaking than i think you would expect from a six eight forward so him not playing, I think, is totally fine because he has three years of tape, and those three years of tape show a player who's gotten better. And uh, I, I like Laravia. I think he's one of those guys that I would honestly I wouldn't be shocked if he falls into the early second round, and the team's going to be very thrilled if they get him. But I could totally uh, see him being. Uh, yeah, I, I, I think he's looking now early twenties. You know, that that's that's where I would put him. I would put him at lowest, maybe twenty five, like twenty five to twenty range. Right is where I would look at him. But I think again, he's just kind of an unassuming player who doesn't do anything so well and isn't such a freakish athlete that he stands out. If he fell, I wouldn't be shocked, but I like Laravia. I think he's one of those guys that's like, this is a guy that can play in the NBA for 10 years and be a solid contributor wherever he ends up at. Yeah, most definitely. All right. So uh, what do you think about the next guy on our list? Christian uh, Brown. Well, I always want to say Braun. 
Yeah, I always uh, say Braun. It, but it's Brown, uh, the, at least the way he wants to pronounce it. Um, wh what'd you think about him? Now, he participated in everything. Yeah, uh, I was disappointed in his shooting a little bit. Um, I know I see that, that you have it. I was a little bit kind of, I, I expected him to be sharper with his shooting. Um, with that being said, I'm going to take, you know, years of college tape and stats and a season worth of stats to back up the shooting eye test more so than, you know, in a small setting. Um, I, you know, he's somebody that I didn't think a lot about. Um, you know, when you think Kansas, you know, Ochai was kind of the big, the big name. He's the guy that everyone talked about, you know, as a first teamer, but I really like Christian. I think he's going to be a guy that is going to come in this league and does everything that you want out of a modern NBA kind of forward, um, can shoot. Uh, he's much better. I don't know if he's a great ball handler, but as a pick and roll ball handler and making the right kind of read, I think he can do that at a high level. So I, I'm a fan of, of Christian. Um, I actually like him a little bit more than Laravia, and that's probably just because I saw him more. So my bias thing right. towards the guy who I saw play more. Um, but disappointed in his shooting, but not going to panic just because I think this is a guy who was a little bit off, and I'll take game film. And I, well, he was in the high 30s. Or four, was he 40% from three? 38. 38. 38 for his career. For his career. I don't know what okay. he was for this year. Yeah, for his he was career, he's been 38%. Yeah, so I'm so going gonna, gonna to roll with that. I will, say, I will say when you watch him shoot, there, there seems he seems to have a little bit of a hitch, and I, yeah. I'd have to slow it down to figure out exactly what's going on, but it, it's not the prettiest shot for sure. Um, but you know what? He he tested out as one of the best athletes, if not the best, at the combine. When you know, if you look at him overall performance wise, um, but he he uh, you know, here's an interesting thing: he doesn't have much of a wingspan, but you know what? That's mm. usually a positive. That is usually a positive for shooters. For shooters, yep. You know, Tyler Hero has a negative wingspan. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, the differential. Um, does uh Desmond Bain, I think, has a negative wind he has a negative or, wind or if it's at least it's it's zero, same as his height. Yeah. Um, so but I wouldn't put him in that class of shooter, at least not yet. No, you know, I think no. there's something that needs to be ironed out, but 38% for the career. Um, and he definitely, you know, can can handle uh he actually was forced to play some point in day two because he had to switch teams yep. half hour before the game because there was an injury on one team and so he they only have one guard and so oh, he switched he switched over to the other team i didn't realize that's why yeah and um so yeah so i, I like christian so the next guy did not play um mm -hmm. and the only thing i'd say that we saw consistently from him this year <clears throat> was defense, and that's Max Christie. Um, Max Christie, we know, is a good defender. And what we came away, we didn't see him play, but he tested uh, fantastic, you know, uh, with his, with the different things in the athletic testing. Um, so, again, uh, he definitely was one of the – he was right up there with uh, Brown as far as that goes. Should he have done more? Um, he did okay, by the way, in the shooting drills. Um, I guess he thought that was enough. Uh, I don't know if Max has done enough for first round. Um, I guess a lot's going to depend on his private workouts. What do yeah, you I th yeah, I think defense is going to be the calling card. Um, I, I don't know, Matt, him not playing... I, I couldn't, I mean, I, he tests, they say he tests really well, but I feel like he's kind of an eye test athlete, at least when I watched Michigan State play. I was like, oh, this this guy has NBA-ready athleticism. So I would have liked to see him play because um, I I just don't know if being like, I'm an athlete is enough in, in today's NBA. I mean, I think he gets drafted. That's not to say he's, I, I definitely, this guy's definitely getting drafted. Right, I just would have right. liked to see him play because, you know, I think I watched him play in the tournament and, you know, throughout, the season i'm like yeah i see the nba athlete i just would have liked to see a little bit more polish because that's why I, we have him at 30 because if you're just right. kind of really pushing that one aspect of your game so guys who didn't play i'm always a big believer in the combine this is just a personal like blanket statement i think you should play because that you want to talk about best of the best that you can play against at the moment that's the best of the best if you can't play nba competition play a team of a bunch of all americans first teamers in their conferences 
national champ, all that. That you should go play there, in my opinion. Unless you're hurt, you're hurt, fine. But other than that, you got to play. Right. Because even if his offense didn't show, if he went out there and defended at a really high level against some of these guys, that's going to speak volumes to people. Yeah, that, but, that's my question. That's my question. You know, I mean, could he have done more to improve his stock? And I think he could have. You know, I still think there are significant question marks about uh, his offense. And yeah. um, but we'll see. So one guy, uh, the next guy on our list, uh, Terquavian Smith from NC State, another freshman. Um, did, what do you think of him? Uh, I watched him in the games, um, so I, I didn't get a chance to see any of his, his drills. I know Richie mentioned that he, he had a pretty solid combine in terms of testing um, for all of his athletic measurables. Uh, in the games, I really wasn't impressed at all. He didn't really do anything to me that that stood out. Um, I'm looking at the stats we have. I mean, 35% from the field, 30% from three. Um, you know, I just... I don't know. I, I wasn't really sold on him. Um, I know some of the NC State guys, I think it's him and um, Sebron. I've heard people talking about quite a bit. Um, my feel for him was he just did not look as good as a lot of the other players out there. Like, I just wasn't. He didn't play a lot. I know he didn't play a lot. He only played one still, game. He only played one yeah. game. Yeah. I just, uh, in that he, one game, so He didn't I wasn't play impressed. the second day, and everybody was saying, everybody was saying the second day, well, he played so well. The day before, you know, he didn't have to play today. Now, yeah, he did put 17 points on the board, but he did it on volume. Yeah, uh, he took 17 shots. <laughs> right, so he wasn't efficient at all. Uh, he, he he tested out to be one of the best athletes. You know, again, another one of these, you know, top athletes at the Combine. And he's definitely got the speed and everything else to go with it. Um, he's very light, though. He, he doesn't even weigh 170 pounds. So he's a solid shooter, and he proved that. He shot, I think he shot 36% during the season. Um, he did okay at the shooting drills at the Combine. Uh, I'm not worried about his shooting, but what I'm worried about is him, you know, being able to do anything other than shoot, you know, take right. it to the basket and so forth. So um, I definitely think just, just his testing and the fact that he showed that uh, he could shoot, well, I guess we already knew that, but... You know, he definitely could put points up. <laughs> yeah. And he's not shy about it. But, you know, he was, he like, we're going to say this often today, you know, inefficient, inefficient, inefficient. inefficient yeah. and, that, and that's, you know, a lot of these freshmen were. But I think, the, you know, what, what separates, you know, Smith is the fact that he tested so well. And so right. we know he has an NBA athleticism. Uh, another guy that nobody really talked about uh, at the combine, but I actually thought he improved his stock, and that's uh, uh, we talked about him before uh, mm -hmm. uh, when we talked about the SEC, and that's Keon Ellis of Alabama, and he did not play well in the game. So I'll, I'll straight out, but you know, again, another super fast athlete, uh, and, and and when I say he didn't play well, he didn't shoot well. Uh, but, bingo. but he had he had an impact in the games he was in like his his plus minus for the two games was plus 25 yeah. um so and he was one of the top shooters in the drill and that's what keon is coming in to be he's coming in to be mm -hmm. a three and d guy his handle is not it's not bad but it's not great you know yep. uh he's gonna he's gonna be a cutter he's gonna be a shooter and he's gonna be a defender and he has the athleticism to do so and I, I don't think he's the greatest shooter in this draft, but I think he's a good shooter. And, uh, yeah. and I think it's good enough to get him, uh, you know, early in the second round. Yeah, um, I, I, I don't – I honestly, like, coming out of this combat, I could have cared less about his offense. I just was happy to see him. He did have – I mean, he had four turnovers, but he also had four steals, six assists, four rebounds. Like, he, he showed me that, like, I can do more than just, you know, shoot – yeah. Um, and it, and it's hard. And, and this is something that, you know, we, we talked about this prior, some other guys, like this is also a difficult setting because it is a showcase. And so you're dealing with, I got to get mine that I got to get my mentality. Um, you look at some players who jacked up 17 shots to score 17 mm -hmm. points, um, thinking, Hey, I got to I got to do mine. So I was just happy to see him impact the game outside of, outside of shooting. I would have liked to see him shoot better, obviously. Um, I mean, nine, nine points across the games isn't really great, but he, he was able to do more than just score, which, you know, I think for a guy that we have at 39, that's, that's something that can help out your stock. Right. I, I was talking to uh, Baylor Shireman after the G League elite camp, mm -hmm. and uh, he, he was telling me, actually, it was why he was still there. So it was in between day one and day two there. And 
he didn't play well the first day. And I, I could tell when I interviewed him officially, this was after the official interview, right. I could tell that he was upset. You know, I, I just knew, know him enough to know that he was upset. So we talked later and he was like, yeah, I'm just not used to this. You know, people just aren't playing the right way. <laughs> and I don't, Absolutely. I don't know. I don't know when to get mine and I don't know when to, I don't know when to, you know, play the right way. And, um, but he, he told me, he said, but I think I know what I'm going to do tomorrow. And, and he played better. So, um, eventually Baylor pulled out, but, um, yeah, it's a learning experience for some guys. Absolutely. So speaking of guests and people we know, uh, our guest last week, Jalen Williams, you, you could make the argument that he was the most impressive uh, performer at the Combine. He, uh, he tested very well. He po uh, he po including a, a max vertical of 39 inches. He had a plus 10, plus 10 wingspan. 10 wingspan. <laughs> yep. And this is a guy... This is, uh, and he, uh, he played well in games. He, and he wasn't bad in the shooting drills. He wasn't great in the shooting drills. He was around the average range, but uh, pretty much almost had a full sweep. Um, and this is a guy who can play some at the point and uh, he can also be a, a two or a three. And the thing that I'm most impressed with, believe it or not, is if you look at his offensive numbers, they're fantastic. But when I watch him on tape, the thing that I'm most impressed with is his defense. So um, I, I, I really think that Jalen has, you know, has gone from being, you know, a possible second round pick to now the question is, is will he go in the first round? Yeah, no, Jalen's a guy that I'm a WCC alum. Um, that's where I went for both my undergrad and master's degree. So this is a guy that I saw play against USF, saw play against the Zags, saw play against St. Mary's. And I, I reference those teams because those were the three tournament teams with, you know, the Zags obviously right. being the number one team in the country for most of the year. And every time I'd watch him play, I would just think to myself that, that I, why is this guy's name not coming up? And at the time, I wasn't thinking first round, um, but I was still like, this is a guy that I'm watching score against the Zags defense and carry a massive burden. Santa Clara is not a good basketball team. Like, let's let's say that they are not a great team. And so um, – to get off my little soapbox for West Coast WCC players, I was just really happy to see him play so well because he played better than I thought he would, but he represented how – he represented and showed what he what I think and thought he could be because I watched this guy go heads up with guys like Julian Strother, Andrew Nemhard, Jamari Bouye. Um, you know, St. Mary's might not have a bunch of guys on draft boards, but that's a team that did win uh, Bouye, games in the Bouye, tournament. Bouye uh, is, is, you know, definitely considered a second yeah. round – Player. Exactly. Another player and, we interviewed, by the way. Yeah, <laughs> I, I I think like to me, I, I put it this way: I watched Jalen Jalen Williams play both in the combine throughout the season, and I saw Jamari play a lot because he went to my school. And this is no knock on Jamari. I personally think Jalen is significantly better with significantly more upside. Um, you know, and that's and that's talking about a guy that we saw score thirty four in the tournament, and you know, have put on a show. So yeah, I'm just glad he did well. You know, I, yeah. Yeah, uh, this, this is nothing new to me. How well he plays. Here's the though. other thing about this kid. Um, you can tell that he's got his head on right. He's very mm -hmm. engaging, intelligent. Um, yeah, there's a lot to like about Jalen. Um, next guy, a lot of people are really, really high on, and I wasn't so high. So his stock for me has improved, but I don't know if he improved his stock with everybody else. And that's Ryan Rollins. Now, I, I don't see Ryan. A lot of people are calling him first-round pick. I do not see it. Um, I know he's only, you know, he's going to turn 20 soon. Uh, but, you know, he definitely, you know, he has great length, good, very good speed, very good vertical pop. But he didn't excel in game action. Um, the shooting drills, uh, he, he did okay. And, and he's a 32%. Now I know he's only a sophomore, but still for a career, 32% three point shooter. And I don't really see him enough playmaking for him to, okay. So if you're not going to be a shooter, can you be a, a playmaker? You know, I like Ryan and I think he's a solid second round pick and, and, and and his athleticism did impress me. Uh, he had, and he's longer than I thought he was. But um, yeah, I'm still not completely sold on him. Yeah, this is my first time really seeing Ryan Rollins, and 
I was yeah. I, I agree with you, Rich. Like, he didn't look bad. I, I wasn't like, who is this? Why is this kid out here? Because sometimes when you get these smaller, lesser-known players, um, they get exposed. Um, I'll lost some guys we'll talk about later. But you're kind of like, oh, you don't belong on the same floor as, you know, that first-team All-American guy <laughs> or that tournament champion guy. Um, so I don't think he looked like that. But no. nothing to me stood out to the point where I was like, oh, wow, like, this is a kid that should be on every radar. Like, Jalen Williams is a prime example. Not on a lot of people's radars. And it walks out and you're like, we're not talking. We're talking – first rounder now uh, ryan rollins i'm like okay we're talking that if he gets drafted i won't be shocked but i still think in the 40s 50s is where he's gonna go yeah yeah uh yeah i i, I yeah i think i think his athleticism stood out in the court but you know sure. but as far as making plays making shots not so much you know uh yeah i mean he did some impressive things like i think he got a tip in from pretty far out you know over big guys uh things like that uh, and you can definitely see the speed and he's got wiggle, you know, to him. He can, yeah. um, but, um, yeah, I, he's got a ways to go, you know? So, uh, and, and the thing that concerns me is the 32% from three. So, uh, the next guy is, uh, I, I think one of your favorites. One of and, my favorites. Uh, and, uh, all I can say is, you know, he didn't play the first day. He had a thigh injury mm -hmm. and he came out the second day and he put on a show showing why he's one of the best floor generals, uh, in this draft. Um, and that's, uh, Andrew Nebhart from Gonzaga. You want to talk yeah. about him? I think, um, testing wise, first and foremost, one of the things about Nebhart that goes super underrated is how well conditioned of an athlete this kid is. We're talking about a guy that was playing in big games, 40 minutes a game. And I mean, pushing, obviously, and pushing, and push, and pushing tempo constantly, right? You know, and some of that could be during the WCC they rest a bit because they're not playing the highest level. But in the tournament, I think he played 38 minutes per game against those the high level competition. So I'm not shocked that he tested well because I think this is a guy who knows what it takes to condition himself. I think he's dedicated his work ethic to being in shape to play basketball. But what I love about his game is obviously the, the, the scoring really popped in the 38% from three. I don't think that's he's that's not the type of scorer he is. Um, I, I'm pretty confident in saying that his game is really relying on kind of that that one handed push floater and mm -hmm. the three ball. There's not enough in between creation to be a, to go out and be a 20 point per game scorer. But his playmaking, I just think he has such a sharp basketball mind. And the one thing about playing with the Zags. For a lot of people, they might think, oh, it takes away shots from him. It, it, he has to kind of defer, but it's perfect for a guy like this because it, it allows him to showcase, I can play with superstars or, you know, I can play with better players than me or better scorers than me. And I'm very comfortable getting Chet his shot, getting Timmy his shot in the combine, getting all these other top profile guys their shot, not turning the ball over, um, measures well, you know, competes on defense, has the lateral movement. And, you know, I think of Nemhard as a Warriors fan. I think of him filling that Sean Livingston role. We think of mm -hmm. six men guards, and yeah. we, we've been spoiled by Manu Ginobili and Lou Williams and Jamal Crawford. That, that guard off the bench needs to be crossing people over, scoring 22, 23 a game. Sean Livingston won three NBA championships, averaging six points off the bench, but <laughs> six points off the bench. Great defense. Was a really great playmaker, averaging, you know, four. I mean, if, if Nemhard comes in and gives you seven points off the bench, shoots the ball at 38%, doesn't turn it over, can defend the one or the two effectively, no-brainer. Is he going to be the next coming of Chris Paul? Absolutely not. But I love Nemhard, and I'm just glad to see that. I've seen his stocks slowly rise, and I saw this game kind of as a peaking point for him in terms of he tested well and he looked really good against this competition right. and in one game. So enough ranting yeah, about I, him, but that's my guy. No, 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 I, I agree. And and the thing the thing that everybody always says is he's not a good athlete. He is a good athlete. He's, he's a thing, good athlete. The only, the only thing he can't do is he's not a good jumper. You know, uh, he's not, he doesn't have a lot of vertical pop. Luka Doncic isn't either. Right. I and mean, I know that's different. Exactly. Luka's a horrible good. athlete. <laughs> <laughs> well, I don't know if he's a horrible athlete. Horrible, but, but yeah. you know what I mean. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, moving on. Um, the next guy uh is a very good athlete and super fast, and that's Darian Sebron, another NC State player. Uh, he's a little older than uh, his teammate. Uh, he, Sebron's 22, and the big concern has always been with him, uh, you know, is his shooting. Uh, career, 25% from deep, 69% from the line. Um, he shot pretty well in the drills. Uh, he tested very well as, as, as expected. Uh, as I said, he has tremendous speed, explosive first step, loves to attack the rim. The question is, is can he, um, you know, can he make the pull up, you know, can he hit an occasional three? 
Um, he made one of two, I think, in game action. And like I said, he shot pretty well in the drills. So I think there's a lot of hope. And he and he's a bigger guard. He's he's uh, mm -hmm. like 6'4". Um, so I, I think with that athleticism, uh, you know, as, as a guard and that speed, you know, he's certainly going to get a, a good chance to prove himself. And he could be one heck of a player if he, if he develops that shot. The, the thing about him that I really liked uh, is that he rebounded the ball really well for a perimeter player at NC State. Um, I think he averaged like eight a game. And he, <coughs> excuse me, rebounded well um, in combine game action as well. I think he had 10 total rebounds across the games. And so for me, that's kind of one of those skills where it's like, okay, that's something that I feel I like can carry over. I know some people that are really high on him. Um, personally, I, I, I'm not just because I, I question the, the shooting ability, but I do love the explosiveness and I do love his willingness to get in there and mix it up on the boards. If he really is six, seven, or even if he's six, no, six, he's six, not. five, he's not. I'm, he's, looking yeah. at the, I'm looking at the measurements. He's six, five, six, nine, okay, six, five, six, five, yeah, I don't, six, nine wingspan. Yeah. I, I, that's why you said I was kind of confused because I just pulled it up. But anyways, if he's willing to get in there and rebound that way with that athleticism, I think he can carve out a bit of a niche role. And if he can get the shooting to where it needs to be, um, yeah, I, I totally think this is a guy that we haven't listed at 48. I think as a basketball player, if he can get the shot right, he's better than that. But today's NBA, you've got to be able to put the ball in the basket um, right. from range. And you've, if you're going to be a ball handler, you've got to be able to hit free throws. Uh, and, we've seen that in the playoffs right um, well, the other, this year the other thing is I, I think you know i mean his probably his best fit is being a big point guard but i don't yep. know if his playmaking you know is as yep. polished you know so he's got to do one or the other and it'd be nice mm -hmm. if he could do both but i don't he can you know he's definitely make he's definitely got playmaking potential and i and i think you know he showed at this combine that you know he yep. can shoot better than he did at nc state Knock down an open jump shot. Doesn't have to, everything doesn't have to be a step back three. If you can just no, hit the no, corner shot, definitely catch not. and shoot corner shot, value through the roof. Yeah, yeah. Now, this guy, uh, no one is talking <laughs> about, but I know TJ uh, loved uh, TJ, Mus TJ Musa loved Diabate from Diabate. Michigan, the power forward. And uh, TJ was, uh, and it was like me, you know, when you look at him, and I think this was TJ's words is he just looks like a basketball player. And he does, you know, he's six foot 10 and he's solid, he's strong, and he measured with less than 3% body oh. fat. Jesus. And he, his athletic testing, you know, in our database, his, his numbers would have been good for a guard. And this guy's six foot six 10. ten. Yeah. <laughs> This is us. This is a sub team. This could be a team's future center. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Now, the only thing he really did well in game action was rebound. Um, but, you know, so he's got a long ways to go as a shooter and as an offensive player. But, uh, and, and he may get pulled out of the draft. But I'll tell you what, you know, just he, he, he can rebound and play defense for you. And he's a hell of an athlete for his size. So I definitely see him being drafted. A lot of people are, are not even, lit, you know, don't have him listed in draftable range. And I, I, just, I just don't understand it, you know. Um, yeah. If he showed a little bit of offense, you know, more offense at this combine, I, I could definitely see people talking about him early second round. But as it is, you know, he didn't show you anything new. Mm -hmm. But uh, the athleticism, I, you know, I, I, as TJ said, he looks like a basketball player really moves well on the court. Um, so, yeah, it would be interesting to see if he stays in the draft or not. Yeah, I, I, this is a guy that – and this is where I get kind of confused by NBA just people sometimes, whether it's people in a front office to talk about the league. Is This is a guy that, like, there's so many people throughout the years we've seen get drafted really high just because of the physical potential. I mean, and we're talking, like, really high. And this is a guy that's even on draft boards. And we're talking about like a late second rounder in that 50 to 45 range, probably, who looks like I, this is where I would take the dart throw. This is where I look at this guy and go, if I can teach this guy one or two post moves to hit his free throws at 70%. And, and he's not a bad free throw shooter. As yeah. It is. Yeah. And get him to be comfortable. Actually, I think he's that. well over 70%. Well, um, yeah. I just think like, why would this, why would this, this is the perfect time to take that dart throw. No, he's not. I, uh, he said sixty-two percent. So okay, yeah, I stand correct. But I just, to me, that's where my brain sometimes gets confused. Like sometimes we see guys like this get valued super highly. I we talked about in our last episode, Leonard Millard 
shot to 17 on Bleacher Report's mock draft <laughs> at one point. And that's not to throw shade at Bleacher Report, but – uh, 17. No, no, I think we should. I think we and should. I'm looking That's at, ridiculous. And then you I look can, at Diabate. You cannot watch that guy for more than 10 minutes to think that, okay. to think that, he he's, that he's a first-round pick. Yeah, and, and and I mean, that was before the combine where we got – we really – the world kind of really got to see him, sure. But still, like, oh, the physical profile, the potential. We These guys are 6'10". Yeah. We said this before the combine that yeah. Leonard Miller wasn't draftable. Yeah, and I'm like, Diabate is a 6'10", freak athlete who does rebound well, who played at Michigan, not in a high school prep league team. And, you know, we got to see, and we're talking about him not being on boards, but somebody else who's physically impressive and has physical potential is a damn near a lottery pick. Just confuses me. I don't know enough about the, I know TJ was the Diabate guy, um, but I, I just watching him like, yeah, if this guy can figure out one or two post moves and get comfortable with a mid-range jump shot and a free throw, this guy's going to make it in the NBA to some degree, no doubt. I, I think the Mavs the Mavs needed a player like him, you know. Against the Warriors. Against, against the Warriors, you know. They got they got they destroyed need, by Kavon Looney. They don't Looney. need the offense. They just need somebody to grab boards and block shots. Somebody to yep. cancel out Looney, you know. Absolutely. Right. And so, all right. So the next guy is somebody I've been slowly warming up to, and now I feel he's definitely going to be drafted, <laughs> and that's Michael Foster, you know. Um, Michael, you know, kind of looks on the heavy side, but you know, he actually didn't at the combine. I think he may have dropped right. some weight. Um, and uh, he's 6'8, 240 pounds. He didn't do anything exceptional at the combine except for the shooting drills. He shot well for right. shooting drills. And the two things we've been saying about Michael that we're concerned about is his shooting. You know, he made like 30% from deep uh, with the G League Ignite. And um, and his form, his form is off, but I think he's improved that form uh, from watching mm -hmm. him at the combine. He still takes a little too far back, um, but uh, like I said, he shot very well at the drills. He tested, he tested well for somebody at 240 pounds, and his body fat wasn't bad. Uh, so that means he's got a lot of that 240 pounds is muscle. Um, so and he he really moves well for his size and. Um, so, yeah, Michael's somebody, I think, again, a lot of people saying not going to be drafted. I, I, he's going to be drafted. Mark it down. Yeah, he played, uh, if I recall, he played really well in the games. It, maybe not so much scoring-wise, but I think he had like six or – he had like six five blocks. or six blocks. Yeah. yeah, like he just – he he impacted the game. Now, I'm not saying he's gonna, at 6A he's going to come lead the league in blocks in the NBA, but he was blocking shots. Uh, he was pretty active on the boards. I think he had 10 or 12 – across the games he played in. I he just he looked like he belonged out there. Yeah. Um and you know I we when we did our last episode on the, some of the lesser known prospects, um obviously Dyson Daniels was the G League guy that I was really keyed in on and I mean we're projecting him pretty pretty high. But yeah, Foster definitely like kind of surprised me because I didn't really pay much attention to him at all um when I was watching Dyson Daniels play. Um but watching him here, I saw a player that I don't think will ever be outstanding, but definitely could fit in the NBA and um uh, you know, the six blocks are what really kind of jump-started, you know, my, oh, okay, this guy's, he's a better athlete than I kind of thought he was. And, you know, his scoring could come, but I think he still shot the ball pretty well in the games, if I remember. He also plays was, with effort. He also yeah. plays with effort. And you don't yeah. necessarily always see that out of uh, guys coming out of the Ignite, you know? Yeah, I mean, he shot 40% from three in the games. I mean, obviously small volume, but, you know, I, I, I saw a player that I definitely could see a little bit of three and D in him. And like you said, he, he plays hard, and that's going to carry him. You know, in these second round guys, sometimes that's the deciding factor is who wants it more. And as cheesy as that sounds. Right, right, right. So the next guy on our list is a uh, triple crown winner. He went to, went to <laughs> oh, Port he went to Portsmouth, then he went to the G League Elite Camp, and then he um, played so well there <laughs> that they brought him to the NBA Combine. And that's Tyrese Martin of Connecticut. I think the only other guy I know to, who did that, made that run was uh, Jared Roden. Um, so he played a ton of minutes between the two combines. Um, he's he's a glue guy. He's a three and D guy. Um, he uh, he had thirty one boards, you know, for a yeah. wing uh, in four games. Uh, shot thirty seven percent from deep, which was a little see. That was the thing. This was this was the first year that Martin shot well from three mm -hmm. at Connecticut. And so that's what got him. He shot 43% at Connecticut this year. And that's what finally got him uh, his shot to, uh, you know, 
to to get to invited to all these things. Um, so what do you think of Tyrese? Yeah, this is a guy I didn't know too much about. Again, coming in UConn, I you know I I picked him to win a game in the tournament for, for what that's worth. Um, I didn't know too much, but I I just felt that um, you know when I looked into him and saw how much he was playing in terms of all these com combine games. That's why I did a little bit of a deeper dive, and I, yeah, I think the ideal three like three and D glue guy I think is the perfect fit for him. Um, the shooting has to hold up, um, and it looks I think it will. Um, you know to shoot that well in the college season and then to come to a setting like this a couple months removed from college basketball and still shoot well against high competition in that setting, I think speaks volumes. Um, and I think for me, I was like, well, let's see how he tests. Cause I just, I didn't know anything about him in terms of, he never popped to me enough to be an athlete. The fact that he tested well, I think helps him out. Um, I, I think this is a guy that's going to find his way into the league and um, you know, he's going to learn how to shoot and he's going to hustle and he's going to play hard. And I mean, hell I'm complaining about one weekend at a music festival. This guy played at three high level combines and I'm like, coming home and tired sleeping in and this guy's out here playing basketball nonstop probably hasn't stopped playing since they got bounced in the tournament so no I, I like that mindset you know to, again we, we joke but I think there's something to be said about a guy having the self-awareness to realize where he stands in terms of this drafting process and going I'm going to play my ass off whenever wherever against whoever and to show up and so I think that kind of speaks to the mental makeup. Maybe I'm getting too much on like an old school. My dad would be proud of me soapbox over here. But I, I think that that has to mean something, that this guy played at all these situations, continuously earned a ticket, his ticket, and never once backed down, and then played well. Like he could have easily gotten there, played bad, and like, well, I've been playing so much, I'm tired. No, he went out there and had 31 rebounds, shot the ball well. I like that. I can get down with a guy who, who, who plays like that. That, yeah. that means something to me. Uh, no, he's definitely the type of guy that, that they're looking for in the second round. Somebody who's not yeah. going to demand the ball. Somebody's going to mm -hmm. just do, you know, whatever you ask. And that's Tyrese Martin. Um, so another big winner and a surprise uh, was Amino Muhammad. You know, first of all, he tested out average athletically, but he's okay. a big guard. You know, he's six foot four, 213. And he, he's muscular, and he's got a plus seven wingspan. So all that is plus. Uh, he shot very well in the drills. Um, and I, I thought he played well in the games, especially day two. Uh, he really – he's he, he likes to play inside the arc. Um, okay. And, you know, he likes to drive the ball. He likes to, you know, like maybe do some mid-range post-up type of stuff. Um but, you know, he wasn't efficient at Georgetown, but the one thing he did do well this season, and this really bodes well for him, he was 80th, 80th percentile as a catch-and-shoot jump shooter. So even if, even if you don't think he's going to be the type of guy that you want the ball in his hands and have him attack the rim all in all, right. with that size, you know, again, he, he, he shot around 30% from three, freshman season he's a little older for a freshman he's, he's like 20 and a half but um you know the fact that he shot well from the catch and shoot and he definitely showed at the combine that he could make plays off the dribble and he was very aggressive attacking the rim um and so much so that he got fouled 14 times uh oh, in, 40, in 49 minutes so and he made 11 of those shots that's 79 percent so, yeah, he'll definitely, you know, he's going to draw fouls. Uh, he's got good size. Uh, I, I really think he's improved his stock from being one of those guys that I would say I would would have recommended going back to school. And I probably still would. But I now think he's in serious contention for a second-round pick. Right. So he's on the radar now. That's good to hear. Yeah. Um, that's the funny thing about the combine is kind of realizing there's a lot more players out there than the, you know, the Chet Holmgrens and the Jabaris of the world. Um, because this is a guy I didn't know any, really know anything about. So no, he was a highly, highly touted freshman. Yeah. And he was like a yeah. five star guy. So uh he's just been what I guess because he went to Georgetown, even though he was a five star, he, people haven't been paying attention. Yeah, lost to him. in the fold. Yeah. Um, and uh he took care of that, I think, in day two at the combine. Say, hey, look at me. <laughs> yeah. So um, next guy is somebody who definitely uh, has had plenty of exposure, the leading scorer in the SEC, uh, a son of a NBA great, and that's Scotty Pippen Jr. Um, Scotty's a bucket getter. Um, you know, the big thing with him, uh, well, actually, there were two big things, I think, coming into the season was his shooting 
And he still, again, didn't shoot a great percentage um, from three. He's a 34% career shooter at Vandy. But the yeah. other thing was last year when he came to the Combines, he didn't Horrible. test well. He didn't yeah. test well for a little guy. This year he did. And so that just shows you, you know, one, either, you know, you get a year older, you get stronger, you practice these things a little more, and you yeah. can come to the Combine and you can do these drills a lot better. And that's what Scotty did. And um, – so you have you have thoughts on Scotty Pippen? Yeah, so he played exactly how I thought he would, not in a bad way. Just he passed. He he was a playmaker. I think he had nine assists across his games. Um, de defended well, didn't shoot great from anywhere on the field. Really, um, I mean, like, like you said, he still averaged you know sixteen points a game, which is great, but not the most efficient. So he played how I thought he would. My big question mark was just is he going to test better? And he did. So um, I think he improved his stock solely from. He met the expectations that, like, he played very similar to his statistics in college, like how he played per game basis there, um, scored a little bit less, but it was, was relatively sharp there and tested better. So he couldn't really do anything but help his stock with that kind of a performance because I think it was already somewhat low because of the efficiency concerns and the bad testing. And I think people saw, like, okay, he's a little bit older. Maybe he just took it more seriously. You know, maybe he showed up last year and just kind of thought, oh, okay, I'm, you know, whatever. I I'm, I'll figure it out. Took it seriously. Showed up in shape. Tested well. And then I think he played how I've seen him play. So I wasn't overly impressed, but it's good to see that he wasn't, you know, getting un – he wasn't underperforming in the drills like he did last year. Right. I, I Well, you know, the one thing I love about Scotty is, uh, you know, he, he's very shifty. And part yeah. of that is he's quick and fast, but the other part of it is he's just very creative with changing mm -hmm. speeds, crossing over, and things of that nature. And so that's what makes him a bucket getter. Um, yeah. And but in 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 what I thought that he made a focus of at the combine was playing defense and passing. And, yeah, absolutely. Uh, and I think he achieved his goals for the most part. But what I will say is. In the first half of both games he played, he was like the best player on the court, or at least one of them. And then in the second half of both games, he kind of disappeared. So I don't know what that's about. And so overall, I'd say his his performance on the court, just like you said, he was he was kind of inefficient, but he did other things. You know, four steals and one block, um, plus the nine assists. But uh, again, this is, you know, Will's, can Scotty hit the hit the shot? We know we can hit the pull up, you know. Yeah. Um, so I guess the question is, you know, can he hit it from deep? But I I, I think Scotty has definitely improved his stock and put himself, you know, in position mm -hmm. uh, to possibly be a second round pick. Other guys that uh, we talked about uh, in when we were talking about the uh, G League Elite Camp, I think that have improved their stock. And we'll just list these. And if you have any comments, you can let me know. Um, Jalen Wilson. Um, I, all these guys I would consider second round, like Scotty Pippen, you know, second round possibilities. Mm -hmm. Jalen Wilson, Marcus Sasser, Quinton Jackson, Jared Roden, and Bryson Williams of Texas Tech. I think all of them, you know, when you – they uh, performed well in in the at combines, be it the G League League camp or the combine and or both. And um, yeah, I think they've definitely improved their stock. Any comments yeah, so on any of those guys? I totally agree with the list. Um, I you know I think for a variety of factors is going to probably prevent these guys, or it's gonna it's gonna make these guys have a bit of an upward battle. But I definitely think all these guys could find a way into the league. I'm just a big Marcus Sasser fan, again, coming off injury and how well he played at the, you know, the G League Combine and everything. Um, and then Wilson, Jackson, Roden, Williams, I think are all guys that, from what I saw, improved their stock enough to get drafted. Maybe not, but I think these are guys we're going to see in summer league. These are undrafted. These are definitely guys teams will probably be happy if they don't get drafted. So then they can look at an undrafted situation because all these guys, I think, can play basketball well enough to find their way into the NBA. Yeah. And the one thing about Sasser, the one thing that didn't go well for him was the testing. But yeah, he, just, he was just declared, you know, at the beginning of May, just cleared to play. You know, yeah. so we we have no idea. I mean, he played a lot of minutes at G League yeah. League camp and, um, you know, and he, and he played well on the court. 
you know, he rebounded, mm-hmm. he, he made threes, he, three he passed dropping, the ball. Yeah. I mean, he, he really showed that he could be a playmaker. Um, so the only thing to me, the only, you know, red flag is, is the testing, but I, I got to put an asterisk by that because I don't know if Marcus Sasser is completely up to speed. I, I, I would be shocked if in his, if you, if you hooked up to a lie detector and said, are you hundred percent, do you have no pain? There's no way he says, oh, I'm, I'm hundred percent. I'm playing at my, like, I'm physically at my full capacity. Well, even if he's, even if he's pain free, he still might not be in yeah. shape. Exactly. I mean, he, the last high level basketball he was playing was end of December and, and for to go from that to play at the beginning yeah, of May in March or May sorry May yeah so yeah I think um I think he's going to surprise some people and I wouldn't be surprised if maybe he snuck up a little bit more um just because people I think know what he can do but obviously injury concerns and you know he didn't play a lot hasn't played a lot recently might drop him but I think he's actually a really good player I really like Marcus Sasser a lot of people are also down on him because you know he's only like six foot two, but he had like a yeah. plus six wingspan. So yeah, he's, yeah, you know that makes up for a lot of evils. Um, all right, so now looking at the downside crew, you know a lot of these guys, you we're gonna you're gonna hear it over and over and over again as we go through this list. You know, <laughs> they, they didn't, they didn't, they didn't participate on one level or another. Um, but the first one uh, didn't participate in anything except for getting measured as Shane Sharp. He measured with a nice wingspan, uh, but he didn't do any shooting drills, didn't play in the games, uh, didn't do the athletic testing. So now for me, for a, a mystery prospect like this, and here's the other thing. So f- to my knowledge so far is, you know, any of his workouts have just been one-on-one workouts. And I don't know if you saw that the thing that ESPN was raving about. Look at this guy who can dunk the ball when he's unguarded. You know, <laughs> Oh, so- there was a time in my life I could dunk the ball and I was in <laughs> I'm serious. I mean, they say, look at this fantastic pro day workout from Shaden Sharp. And look, nobody's guarding him. Or, or you have coaches oh, that are, God. you have like 90 year old men that are defending him, you know? And, <laughs> and it's like, I can score against that. Uh, oh, know, my it's God. Just, it's just amazing. This guy is just doing everything he can to avoid um yeah so i i how can you you know he definitely didn't help his st- stock and I, I i gotta think that you know that's just another you know minus against shade and sharp i i don't understand how he gets away with it um i mean i do i do potential the the, the potential that that mystery box that if that if that you know slot machine hits all sevens on this kid for a team they're gonna be thrilled but i I just, for me, and again, this might be me ranting on like the inner old man that I am. How do you get away with not playing anybody? If I'm shade and sharp and I have that competitive fire, I'm like, you know what? I've heard the noise. Everyone's questioning me. All this negative press, all these people are saying that my my camp isn't is, is shady and that I'm ducking competition. You are in a building with the top pro with some of the top prospects in the country, hell, in the world in some cases, maybe even at times, and you choose not to play. Had he gone out there and scored 20 in a game, was playing great defense, three balls dropped. We'd all shut I'd up. Like, okay. I'd be like, all right, man. I, zip. And yet then we have – but on the flip side, instead, he doesn't really do anything. And we have guys like a Tyrese Martin, who nobody really talks about, who – a, a, a combine warrior playing well. And, I mean, I, I just don't get it, and I will never accept it. And for me, I would not touch Shaden Sharp. And I'd rather, I'd rather be the GM in 10 years who goes, man, I missed out. Then the GM that has him is like, oh, my God, it's yeah. Anthony Bennett. Oh. Oh. <laughs> but I don't know. That's just me. Uh, I'm telling you right now, he's going to fall like Michael Porter. He's yeah. going to fall like Michael Porter. Everyone's going to be through. He's going to go top five. He ain't, he ain't going top five. I'm telling you right yeah. now. Um, I, I'd say at best, he's late lottery. Yeah, I mean, I, I, I don't, I don't see him dropping farther than twenty, but I don't see him going higher than ten. Yeah, there's no way. I, I think again when I think they, so there's always noise and there's always a speculation, and the smoke screens. But I don't know how a team, if you're in the top ten, you're in the top five, you were not very good that year. You need reinforcements. You need somebody that you can hopefully stake into your franchise as a cornerstone. And a guy like this is probably not going to be able to do that for you. Or you don't know if he can, at least. You have seen nothing that proves that point. 
Like, are there questions around Chet Holmgren? Yes. Are there questions around Paolo? Yes. But at least you can ask, but there's also some answers. I saw Chet defend the rim at a high level. I saw him shoot the three ball well. I saw him handle the ball for a seven-footer. I saw Paolo really rise to the occasion in March. And yeah, maybe he too much iso ball, but I saw him hit big shots. I, I saw all those things to counteract the negatives. But Shaden Sharp, I've seen none of it. Don't bring me high school. I do not want high school tape. I or hate AAU. that. AAU. Or AAU. I, I was fortunate enough to see Aaron Gordon play basketball in high school. He played against my rival school. I saw Aaron Gordon, who was, I believe, the fifth pick in his year. Of course he was better because he was bigger, faster, stronger than everybody. He dunked on everybody. What the hell does that tell me? I would hope. Shaden Sharp, yeah. Sharp doesn't do that. <laughs> doesn't do doesn't that. Do I that. don't know. He's a jump so, shooter. He's a yeah. jump shooter. He stays away from attacking the rim. So, look, man. I hope he's a it jump works shooter. He's a jump shooter that shot less than 35% in yeah. AAU ball. Yeah. I I hope it works out because I don't wish ill upon a kid. I know that we, the money, the fame, the clout that comes in today's sports world, I'm sure there's a lot of people trying to attach themselves to this kid and I I do genuinely feel bad for him, but at the same time this is the moment that I was really hoping he would rise to the occasion, and he didn't. And so I'm not putting my stamp on a kid that I question your competitive fire. I question the advice you're getting. And, hell, I don't know if you're really that good of a basketball player. So right. that's what right. it is. Uh, he, he's a perfect guy if you get two first-round picks. You know, like say you got yeah. – I, I think somebody does. I forget which team. I know the Thunder have a couple. I, right. So and, – yeah. and I think they're like 10 and – like 15 or something like that? Yeah, right oh, outside the lottery, so I think. 10, 10, you take the guy you want, and then 15, you take him. Yeah, agree. That, that's the perfect strategy. If I have two picks, sure, I'll take him. Yeah. All right, so uh, Bryce McGowan's, and again, we're going to say this a lot, you know, guys who came off inefficient seasons, you know, he scored a lot of points, but he was also highly efficient in the process, high volumes, you know, type of guy. And um, he didn't play, uh, and uh, he did compete in the shooting drills. He did okay testing. That was the thing. You know, we thought he was a tremendous athlete, and at least at, at the combine, he didn't test out. Yeah. You know, he tested out of the average range, and his wingspan's only about three three <laughs> inches, um, you know, plus three. So uh, McGowan's, uh, you know, he didn't help. I he didn't help himself uh if anything you know by testing average athletically when everyone thinks he's a great athlete uh had to hurt him yeah i i wish he would have played i again i'm also the believer if you're at one of these events you should play in, in just my personal opinion i still have hope for him as a shooter to some degree i know he shot the free throws he shot free throws really well in, in college i don't think his volume was super high but he was 83 plus percent on free throws in college so I, there is a workable jump shot there um, but I just wish he would have played because, you know, I don't like to be the guy that like, you know, stakes everything into like the athletic testing, but it does matter at, you know, at the NBA level. No, I'm not, I'm, I'm not NBA. doing that. I'm just saying. No, I know. Yeah. That's the only I thing agree. we got to, that's the only thing he really exactly. did, you know? And, no. And, yeah. And that was average. And, and like I said, shooting drills, he was average, you know? So that's what I'm saying. If, if you're just and average. A lot of people are calling him a first round pick and yeah, no, everything, I, everything he did do was average average no and, that, and that's right yeah that's what i'm saying like if, i don't like to stake it on that but if that's all you give me and what i've seen is again average then i that has to start weighing in like to me the athletics are that icing on the cake and if the cake is a little bit stale and then the frosting sucks well <laughs> or isn't great then you're like okay well it's not that great of a piece of cake you know so <laughs> that's just that's just how i look at it I, i'm right. not saying that you know oh you should only care about the numbers you know i know like in football the 40 is everything to some people here it's not as much in basketball which is is nice but um yeah i just wish he would have played a little bit because okay you had a solid if unspectacular college season and then you didn't test that well athletically that's all you're giving me i you know the two plus two equals four kind of thing you were okay in the season you tested okay so i have to assume you're just okay right so we have another guy um, similar in a lot of ways to McGowan's, yeah. and that's Blake mm -hmm. Wesley, uh, similar size uh, and so forth, similar profile in the sense that uh, wasn't efficient, especially from deep. Um, I think he shot a little better than McGowan's, but uh, still I think he was only like 30%. And I I've seen Blake Wesley play uh, at least 25 times this year. Mm -hmm. um, I was – I, I'm actually friends with people at Notre Dame, and I told as many as I could that he shouldn't go. He, you know, um, 
but he's going and uh, he tested even worse than uh, McGowan's. Uh, you know, he's a talented kid, but he's an average athlete at best. He does have a nice wingspan, plus six. Um, but I just think he has a long ways to go, um, you know, in terms of shooting, playmaking, and and defending. You know, I've seen guys blow right by him. Um, so, yeah, uh, I, I think, again, Blake's another guy everybody's calling a first-rounder, and um, it, I, I, it may not happen. Yeah, I, I agree. This is a player that I, I, I think absolutely needs an- – I, I look at what he's done. I'm like, dude, give yourself another year. You could – improve in some ways i mean you you were a freshman and you did score 14 points you did grab four rebounds like i just see a player that could another year of seasoning and and i hope you know this year there were a lot of like you know super sophomore guards you had the johnny davises the matherins the jay and ivies who came back and and i mean really improved their stock to where they're all going to be lottery picks i'm like the blueprint i for wesley i'm like dude you, you already showed you have promise Give yourself one more year and go from 14 points to 20 points. Right. Get your shooting percentage into the mid 40s. Get that three ball up into the mid mid 30s. You know, like with McGowan's, I did say I have some hope because at least his free throw percentage was really sharp at 83. What's he's at 66? So it's like right. I have to start wondering: is it a mechanical thing? Like, is it a mental thing? What is it? So it, it's a little bit disappointing that's going to come you know, out. You know, I think there's you a really good player I, in there. I think happened with him is you know he is the best player to come to Notre Dame in quite yeah. some time and and yeah. Notre Dame was really psyched you know to finally yeah. have you know cuz it, it seemed like every year Notre Dame had one star player uh, you yeah. know and uh and he looked like the next one and of course when you go to Notre Dame just like Villanova you're not expected to be a one and done and yeah. he's going that route. And I think what's going to happen is he's probably going to end up being late first rounder, early second rounder. And, uh, you know, when he could be a lottery pick if he stayed around another year. Yeah, I, I just think the inefficiency is going to see him, A, probably getting drafted lower than he he thinks, and then B, might be in the G League a lot longer than he thinks because yeah, I, yeah. I he, mean, he's not ready to contribute. I, I don't in know. My who, you know, when when he first really came onto the scene, everybody had him like shot him up their draft boards and had him yep. like you know fifteen twenty. And I'm like, have you watched the guy play? I mean, he's good, but he's not that good. <laughs> yeah, I mean, he had that. He had a really good stretch of games, and I remember it was one of the first few times I saw him. And it, granted, it wasn't against top competition, but he he scored like twenty plus, like three or so games in a row. He he was playing really well. I remember, like, that's when I, I, again, his name, I think, for me, started to serve. And I was like, oh, yeah, this kid can, can kind of play. But there is a whole season to be had. And, you know, you look at he, – he really tapered off near the end a little bit there for me. Um, and and, has these, kids, kind of and these kids are getting bad advice. If you just want to be drafted, if you're McGowan's and Wesley and some of the yeah. other guys are going to name, if you just want to be drafted, okay, okay, maybe you did the right thing by not participating. But – if you actually want to be a first round pick, get some guaranteed money, then you're probably better off not going into yeah. the draft. I, so, I, I think the combine is a trap for some of these kids where like they go thinking, oh, I'm just going to test. And I'm so, dude, you're not going to get away with that. If you don't play and you're on the fringe, it almost people they don't, question think, your, they, they don't yeah. think they're on the fringe. The, 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 that, people, that's what I'm saying. people are telling them that they're not. Yeah. But, uh, you know, if you took around everybody who's saying this guy's a first round pick, we better have 60 first round picks because that's exactly. how many guys are getting told this bullshit. <laughs> yeah. You know, I mean, and it's, yeah, it, the lack of awareness sometimes from both players and their support systems is a little bit sad because you already look every year. There's kind of 10 guys. That you're like, those are the top 10 players. Like those are those are the top the lot. Those are the top 10 lottery guys that leave 20 picks for everybody else. And like you said, Rich, there's 50 other kids thinking, well, I could be a first. Hell, I could be a first rounder. <laughs> I anybody can. I don't know. Like you know, it, it's not well, that actually, simple. Actually, like, Hugh Hugh is eligible for the draft this year. Automatically eligible. So Hugh, uh, if you if if you if you catch this episode, Hugh, uh, screw it. Go go do it. I want to <laughs> see you walk across and put the cap on, man. He doesn't. He doesn't have to declare though. He he doesn't. He's automatically. Oh, in that's this, true. He's, automa- he's yeah, automatically exactly. in this draft pool. Um, yeah. of course he's ever since uh, he. College basketball season, he's become a hopeless alcoholic. But anyway, that's another story. Um, all right, so next guy on our list, uh, probably should pick up the pace here. 
is uh, Trevor Keels. And what's uh, interesting about Keels is when you first look at him or when everybody did, oh, he's solid as a rock. Well, he's solid already, but he's not muscle. He had the fourth highest body fat <laughs> at the combine, and he's only a 6'4 guard. Um, uh, and as uh. a result, he tested very poorly. Uh, so, And he's not that long. So Trevor, you know, had a nice season, not great, but had a nice season. Uh, but basically he's uh, overweight. Uh, and um, yeah, I've seen it over and over again. Overweight guys just sometimes slide right off the draft board. So I hope he goes back, gets in shape, has an excellent season. Uh, though Duke is bringing in a ton more players, so a lot of talent. Yeah, so unfortunately, kind of for the guys who want to come back, you know, well, you don't have to come back to Duke. You know, you can go somewhere else. Yeah, but uh, yeah, I, 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 you know, I still, you know, have Trevor, you know, being drafted, um, you know, because he, you know, there's a lot of positives from him, you know. Yeah. Uh, you know, he can score at all three levels. Uh, and, and he is strong. He is strong, but he's also carrying yeah. extra weight, um, you know, or he wouldn't have the fourth highest body fat. But, yeah, uh, right now I think Trevor has gone, you know, I think, you know, we kind of had him late first round for most of the year, but now we're looking more like mid-second round. Yeah, I, not much more to be said. I'm, I'm actually not the biggest Trevor Kales fan. I, I thought he was really inefficient. Well, he was really inefficient. Hey, well, I think, again, there, there are positives, but um, hearing – that you know, the physical profile was a negative. I I just it, it starts to raise those red flags. Um, I mean he's he's six four ish, which is good. Like if he was even shorter, but like any shorter now would be a real big problem. So inefficiency plus there's some physical questions. Um, and you know as we've seen with some super high profile guys like Zion, losing weight isn't as simple as I'm just gonna go lift weights. It's kind of a mindset. So um, uh, yeah, not much more to be said. I'm not super high on, but there's talent there for sure. No, yeah, definitely. And um, all right. So the next guy on our list, and, and this one, you know, really surprised me. I'm I'm uh I'm pretty sure uh the guys at Alabama told me he was definitely leaving uh for the draft. And and that is um I'm drawing a blank. Oh, JD Davidson. JD, yeah, and, JD. Uh, I was just looking up the reason why I'm pausing here is because I was looking up his height. He's six one, six one with a 6'7 wingspan. But, you know, the thing about Davidson, uh, you know, everybody said, tremendous athlete, tremendous athlete, tremendous athlete. And so we were willing to overlook, you know, the fact that he didn't play very well this year uh, and didn't really do a hell of a lot for Alabama, thinking, well, he's still going to get drafted because he's a tremendous athlete. Well, he didn't test out very well. Uh, the only thing he really did well was uh, vertical. And even his vertical, you know, as a max of 37 is nice, but it's not, uh, it's not earth shattering. Um, so again, another player who chose not to do the drills, chose, or, you know, not to do the shooting drills, chose not to play. And so what's he banking on here? What is JD Davidson banking on? He he's banking a, on the fact that everybody says he's an athlete. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and, and, and I'm, again, you know, you know, these tests, you know, you know, you, you could, you know, he, you know, maybe he had a bad day or whatever. And, 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 you know, the eye test says he's a good athlete, but again, he didn't test out very well. And uh, what did I say? He's six one, right? Six one. Yeah. Yeah. You don't, a six one guard should be blistering. Okay, yeah. up and down the court and all these drills. Okay, yeah, and he he tested out, and this is in comparison to everybody. So we're including yeah. the seven footers. He tested out in the average range. <laughs> yeah, and that and that that's that's where my problem is. Like I do agree. Like you look at guys like Scottie Pippen, and maybe they have a bad day. But when you're like six one and you know six feet six one, and you have to have and you you should be, and you're being profiled as this elite athlete. Maybe it's unfair, but you don't really get to have a bad day. Like athletically, like no, no, no. You get the ball, push the tempo in game. Uh, when you're testing and all your cones and shuttle drills, you got to be hauling ass. And so I, for me, I was never a big JD Davidson fan. Anyways, um, I was actually never a big Alabama fan this year. Anyways, as a, as a team, no, but, they didn't play well. Um, they didn't play well. Yeah, and he um, was part of that problem. And he was part of that problem. So it's another one of those guys where it's like, dude, just you got to come back because I look at others really small guards 
And, you know, I think he, I, I, he's definitely, in my opinion, a better actor than a guy like Tiger Campbell, but that's a guy like Tiger Campbell, who's at least like he's found out a way to be successful at 6'1. Right, so maybe right. go look at that. And and, Tiger and, Campbell and copies. is a hell of a playmaker and has turned yeah, into a great exactly. shooter. I'm like, cop, go, go look at him as the example. Go, okay, I'm already a better athlete. Plus, if I can get my shooting, a little bit of playmaking, just, just a little bit stronger, now, we're, now I have something. Um, but instead, he's, you know, testing poorly. And like you said, when you look at the averages of the entire combine, it is not a good look when everyone talks about you being an athlete. You're only 6'1", and then you're not really outperforming anybody that you should. You're barely outperforming the people that you should be. And one of my favorite players uh, on this list uh, is Jalen Williams of Arkansas. And unfortunately, mm -hmm. he had a dreadful <laughs> dreadful combine uh he didn't play well on the court he didn't shoot well in drills and he tested out poorly and he didn't have a great wingspan um other than that it was a fine experience for the young man <laughs> uh you know i i love Jalen. you know i mean he did okay when he didn't play much um in the games i'm not sure if he got nicked up or not but uh or maybe he just bowed out because I can't believe somebody make him a promise based on everything that happened there. No way. Um, so, you know, he, what I love about Jalen is uh, he does have potential to stretch the floor, but it's not there yet. Uh, he, he's good inside. He can block shots. Uh, he's great at taking charges. Um, and uh, he's a very underrated passer, very good passing mm -hmm. big man. Almost three assists uh, a game, I think, for the season. Yeah, and 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 that's what he had in 20 minutes, you know, at the combine. He had three assists. But, you know, there's just so many factors working against him. You know, he still might get drafted. Um, but, you know, what it shocked me when he said he was staying in the draft. And I was like, dude, you couldn't have had a worse combine. Yeah, um, that was disappointing for me to hear. Because I think Jalen Williams, the thing is his his draftable skill set is that he's just kind of a do he does he he makes basketball plays like winning plays takes charges makes the right pass um you know defends but at the same time like as as great as that is you also need to back it up with some more like tangible production and the fact that he didn't do anything really well and was already kind of like a question mark guy you know like there was there were already concerns it just kind of upsets me because I, like I said I do like him like I was pulling for the Zags I'm a Zags guy. But he like played so well and like did so many great high level things, and it's like that's what's gonna get him drafted. But you've got to package that with a little bit more than just you know winning plays. You can find a lot of guys willing to take a charge, a lot of guys willing to make the right play. You got to separate yourself with a little, just even just a little bit of just a little bit more would have been nice. But right. <laughs> there was right. nothing in those twenty minutes. Yeah, I, there was I'm just worried. That I was like, I'm just worried right about. now with the lack of foot speed. You know, yeah. you're not gonna nobody. They're not gonna put him on the court. You know, because exactly. he's not—he's not an exceptional shot blocker, but he can block shots. Yeah, you know, and and he really can't shoot yet. Um, no, so, not at all. And, and in order for you to use that post ability, you need to be able to draw people to you. But he can't. <laughs> he's not going to do that at, at the pro oh. level. So yeah, he should have gone back. Bad decision. I don't know who gives ki these kids advice. Um, so Chris Murray. Uh, Keegan's brother, twin brother, the uh, not so highly regarded one, did not show up for the combine. He was invited and turned it down. No one knows what this means because he turned it down pretty much immediately. So, you know, some people are saying maybe you got a promise. Promise? He, he, he didn't even go anywhere. Hey, whoever no. promised them was all like, they told him, hey, Keegan, we're going to draft you. And Keegan's like, well, you got to draft my brother. And they're like, oh. <laughs> Fine, we'll take your brother. That's the only way. That's, that's, that might not be too far from the truth. That, that's the only way this kid got a promise is because someone told Keegan, you're our guy. And he said, I'm only showing up if you bring my brother along for the ride. You never know. You never know. But he did not, not. He did not show up. Uh, now, Keegan didn't do anything at the combine himself. He didn't get measured or yeah. anything. Um, but um, I don't know why you wouldn't get measured at least. But he was there physically. Yeah, um, I, I just what is the advice you're getting? Uh, like, what? Who? Hey, we're gonna fly well, you out know there. Be there. Well, maybe Take his pictures. wingspan. Maybe his wingspan's not that great. You know? Oh yeah, I, yeah, that wouldn't surprise me. I you could know, see that so, being. So you know, maybe they don't want him even measured. 
Uh, I don't know. Oh, man. But anyway, I can't it. see how Chris Murray helped himself. Uh, <laughs> and nor Keegan, for that matter. But at least we know Keegan's doing workouts and so forth. And yeah. uh, I know for a fact that Keegan's doing workouts in groups, unlike Shaden Sharp, who does them with 90-year-old ladies. <laughs> um, so. Oh, man. Uh, Shaden, you can uh, write your emails to admin at hoopsprospects.com. <laughs> While you're at it, give me a follow on Instagram too, man. I appreciate it. You can DM me. So the next guy actually uh, announced today that he's uh, uh, retur yeah. uh, returning to Stanford. So I don't know. We won't go into any detail with him. That's Harrison Ingram. Didn't test well. Didn't shoot well in drills and didn't play. Uh, well, he's definitely making a wise decision. He uh, absolutely. I don't think he was, you know, any better than going to be a at best was going to be a early second round pick based on what he did this season at best. Yeah. Uh, but I think, you know, he was probably going to go undrafted. So uh, another guy was a guy we talked about somewhat uh, recently in our international episode, and that's Hugo uh, Bisson. Um, Hugo is a bucket getter. You know, he, he's, he, sh he makes some crazy shots with his floater game. Uh, he's a good shooter and he's not shy about shooting. And that's the problem. He's not efficient. Uh, but the, and he was excellent in the shooting drills, uh, at the combine. The problem was he tested out really poorly for a six, five guard, and he only has a plus one wingspan. So, He's never known for his defense to begin with. And then you throw in that, like, I, I think I remember that his overall percentile for the testing was like in the 20s. Now, that's usually a territory for like a six foot 10, a six foot 11 guy, and, yeah. uh, you know, a power forward or a center. And he's, he's down there as a guard. So I, I just think that uh, Hugo, I mean, as it was, his inefficiency, his lack of defense was already working against him. He played okay in the games, but nothing to nothing to really say, wow, you know. So I, I just think he fell out of the I think he's fallen out of draft range. Yeah, I I thought I agree that he he looked really sharp in the shooting drill. So I thought, okay, maybe this guy's gonna go into these games. And he did let it rip. He attempted, I think, 11 threes, or yeah, he attempted double digit threes across the game. Didn't really do much with him. So yeah, this is a guy I was not familiar with at all before the combine. Saw him shoot really well, so I thought, okay, the the stereotype of oh, we got a, a guy, a foreign a foreign player who's coming to the combine and can shoot the hell out of the ball, gets into the games and shot a lot, didn't make a lot, so I just was uh, he's unimpressed. Definitely, he's definitely a three level scorer in yeah. Europe. In Europe, he can be a star. He's like the perfect guy to have coming off your bench as totally. a six man and give you instant offense you know, for a EuroLeague yeah. team. But um, I just don't think he has the athleticism. He does have the athleticism because he – I just looked it up. 15 shots across his game time, 11 of them are from three. And so I just think if you're going to shoot that high of a volume and rely so heavily on it, you've got to be shooting, in my opinion, at the, in this kind of a setting, probably north of – 40% to really get your name out there, if not north of 40. So well, he, I was, he shot uh, the lights out in the shooting drills, but you don't have anybody, Yeah, exactly. But you don't have anybody in front of you. <laughs> yeah, I was like I, – I saw him and I was like, okay, like – Maybe this guy's I, I maybe this guy's gonna come out there and just let it rip and he did and didn't can him and anyone can shoot over a chair or a cone or you know like, like anybody can do that. I do. Um, yeah. And I, so I was unimpressed. Not so much in the sense I thought he was like some horrible trash player. I was just was like, oh, for someone who I, I didn't know anything about, I walked away going, I'm not better or worse as a basketball person not knowing about this guy. Right. Right. So the next guy apparently they think has a promise and uh, he didn't play very well this year. He didn't shoot bad from three. You know, he came into college known as a three and D guy. Uh, and um, unfortunately he didn't show up at the combine. So we don't, we don't know what his wingspan is. He looks pretty long. He has good size. That's Kaleeb Houston of Michigan. Uh, as I said, advertised three and D guy didn't shoot bad from three, but that's about the only thing he did this year was, you know, he was decent for three. I think he's like 36%. Yeah. Um, 36 about. So if he has a promise, you know, I mean, he was like the 10th or 11th best recruit in uh, this class, but you know, he definitely didn't live up to it. And um, I, I don't know what to say. I, you know, apparently it's Oklahoma city. It's looking into him, but uh, that would kind of make sense for those guys. Uh, but yeah, um, 
I so, got nothing else to really add for him. Yeah, well, what can you? He didn't do anything. Yeah, he didn't, he didn't do anything. <laughs> I mean, he is an okay shooter who could become a good shooter. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but that's okay. but that's all we basically saw from him this year. Yeah. He shot less yeah. than 40% from the field, didn't do much on defense or anything else. Uh, yeah. yeah. So the next guy on the list was also a top 15 recruit, five star guy, and that's Peyton uh, Watson. This and, one kills me. And Peyton Watson is uh, a defensive standout who didn't get much playing time at all and didn't show much uh, offense uh, to boot at UCLA. Uh, and what surprised me, uh, he is very long. Uh, I, mm. I think we all knew that, but I thought he would be uh, one of the better athletes. Now he is bigger. Uh, he, yeah. he's he's kind of got power forward size. I think he's nine se- uh, nine seven six <laughs> six seven six eight. He's, a, he's six there. seven six eight. Yeah, yeah. And um, but uh, he didn't test out that great. You know, he was slightly below average. So and he didn't play and he didn't shoot in the drill. So yeah, this is this is a case of a kid that it, it, this one makes me sad because I watched a lot of UCLA being on the West Coast watching guys out here. And this is, and he was highly touted. Um, I always kind of was concerned, just like, is he going to get the shot? Because he was coming in behind that really four-headed monster, of Bernard, uh, Juzang, Haquez, and Tiger. Like, he was going to be at best, the, the fifth guy probably. Didn't really get a chance to shine. Didn't really get to play. Was hurt at times. And I'm just really, I, I see the potential. Like, I would watch him play, and there'd be a moment, a glimpse, where he would chase down block, bat something off the back, when I was like, wow, that was an NBA move. Or transition dunk. And I was like, that was an NBA move. And I just don't – with Hawkes or is Juze, with Juzang leaving, uh, you know, there's just – there's uh, there's a chance for him to come in on a program that is renowned and make an impact and show, hey, I know last year didn't go well, but he was pretty much as low as you can get, in my opinion, without not playing statistically and getting – in terms of getting minutes. So the, the, there's really only room to go but up. It's like, dude, have a great year and come out and really show people. So I'm just bummed because I thought Paige Watson had a lot of potential that some fault of his, some not fault of his, he didn't get to showcase. And now here he is throwing himself into the draft. And I'm like, dude, are you even really drafted? Well, part of the problem was they already had a guy like him in Jalen Clark. Exactly. And so I just think that you just put yourself in a position to where now you're going to have to fight your way through the G League or be a second rounder who has to earn contracts throughout his career. When you could go and maybe and I, I do see the outline of a first round. There's an outline of a first round talent there. It's just got to be filled in. And instead of taking that route, he's gonna now spend the next four years battling through the G League, probably, which kind of sucks. Right. Next guy we have on our list is uh, like Shaden Sharp was once a the number one recruit in his class, though due to injuries. Oh, was he really? Yeah. Oh, he was. Uh, but due to injuries in his senior year, he slipped uh, down to about seven. And then this year had a injury shortened season uh, where he didn't play well when he did play. And he was playing at the uh, university of Milwaukee. Um, so, you know, he wasn't playing against the stiffest competition and he still didn't put up good numbers. Um, then they finally shut him down after about 12 games. We're talking Patrick Baldwin jr. By the way, um, they, you know, so they shut him down. I think about after 12 games, and, you know, I, I, I heard him interviewed, and it seemed like he kind of hinted that the injury still might be an issue. And I can only hope for him in some way that they are, because he was one of the worst all-time testers ever. Uh, for example, uh, I, I think, uh. I think uh, E.J. Liddell's you ready for this? I think EJ Liddell's standing, standing vertical is 10 inches more than his max vertical. EJ's standing vert was 35.5. So it was, oh, it was, it was uh, eight inches, eight inches more than Patrick's max. Wow. <laughs> yeah. So I, I don't know if he's injured. Like I said, he kind of hinted that he was. Um, he's staying in the draft, unbelievably. Oh um, so I, I don't. He didn't do anything, you know. I mean, he he did the he did the athletic testing. He got measured. Uh, didn't. Uh, did he do the shooting drills? 
Uh, yes, he did. He did yeah, okay. He did. he did okay, but nothing great. And that's what he's known for. You know, he's known for being a skinny yeah. stretch for kind of like uh, uh, the uh, Jokic or J- Jovic, Jovic, Jovic the, the, the young Serbian um, who's expected to go in the first round. Uh, so I don't know what to say about Baldwin. Um, you know, there's nothing nothing positive that came out of this combine. Yeah, I've I've been low on him basically from the jump when I saw where he was going situationally, like just the decisions he made and then how poorly he played. Plus, there's an injury history there. I I just to me it all. I, I am a big believer in at some point you've got to show me in a game, not in any in a setting where the the chips are in the center of the table that you can be the guy. And at no point did he really do that for me. I mean, I think he might have had one, one or two twenty point games. Yeah, he had I mean, two games he, 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 20 I plus. mean, statistically, he played okay against Florida, but they lost that game by, like, 40 points. Um, uh, yeah, yeah, it was awful. And, and, and he, he really didn't – I don't think he played against another decent team. Nope. Or, no, they played against Colorado. Uh, uh, and they lost that game by 11, and he had 12 points, five rebounds, 23% from the field, though. Yeah, right, exactly. Yeah. I mean, he, so, just did, he didn't show anything on the court. He didn't show anything here. Yeah, I've got, I've got really no, and I, and this is rough to say. Like, you know, do I think he might get drafted because of the pedigree and because people might like the jump, the, the jump shot? Sure, I and mean, he's still on a lot of draft boards. He's still on a lot of first rounders on draft boards. You know, I, all over the place. Um, not to pick on Bleacher Report, but <laughs> Bleacher Report, cough, cough. Um, I, I just, for me, I just cannot see it. He's yet to show me anything. He hasn't played well. He hasn't tested well. He might still be hurt. I mean, he's been hurt now since he stopped playing. His last game he's been was hurt February for the last 9th. two years. Yeah. So I'm like, what possesses you to go? Oh, this is a guy that's a first round talent. He he compares so. himself his in his situation to Michael Porter, um, which is not a great comparison, folks. He missed what two years? <laughs> yeah, give or take. Uh, right. And and and, like, and I will say that even even with a little bit of time, Michael Porter put in. Uh, even those this those couple of games that he played with Missouri, he looked better yeah. than he looked better oh, than absolutely. Baldwin ever did. Played uh, at a higher level and looked better. Right, played at a so, much higher level. Much, yeah, uh, he but, came yeah, back. Exactly. Michael Porter came back for the SEC tournament. Yeah. So yeah, uh, and the NCAA tournament. Yep. They made that the year or two. So our final guy is Leonard Miller, and uh, <laughs> I don't know if we have anything more to say about Leonard. I mean, nothing on the kid. Uh, I expect him to pull out the draft and either go to uh, college or go to G League. Um, I mean, he measured, he, he did everything we expected. He measured well, 6'9", 7'2", wingspan, 2'10", for an 18-year-old. That's excellent. Um, he, he, he performed very well athletically, you know, probably behind Diabate. He was probably the second most athletic big at this, at this event. Uh, but he cannot shoot, and his in, in his overall game is just generally raw. He looks like an eighteen year old high school player, so uh, I can't see needs to go to college. Yeah, I, I mean, he needs, needs to go to college. I mean, maybe you take him. Well, there's not even a sixtieth pick here. You know, that's a tricky thing. We've lost what two, two picks. Or- yeah, two, two picks. picks. So there's even less room for error this year. So this kid's got to go to college, and I mean, go to a college. Uh, develop for a year. I mean, G League ignites on the table, and I mean, obviously, I'm sure there's money may have an impact, but I mean, go go to college, go develop yourself, and instead of making a couple ten, a couple tens of thousands in the G League night, go earn yourself a multi million dollar paycheck. There's no reason this kid should be on a draft. You can no make decent money with it. NIL too. Yeah, exactly. I'm like, dude, it's it, it like it is okay. Like, it's not like he's been in college three years and this is it. This is his, you know, or four years and this is his shot. Like, plenty of time. I think he'd be – this is – if he stays and decides to keep his name in the in the ring, I would be so disappointed because I think, I think we'd be watching a potential great talent just wither away before our very eyes and never get a shot. So I found out, by the way, why he's eligible for the draft. Oh, okay. Uh, Canada has 13 years of school. So – but for some reason, the United uh... States considers – the United States, or according to the NBA, that 13th year is like a postgraduate year. 
So okay. they consider him to be one year out of high school, even Got though it. he was in high school. Um, okay. If he goes G League, though, if if he goes Ignite, he has to come out next year, whether he's ready yep. or not. That's the nice thing about college, because if you still don't think you're ready, just come right on back. And you're, yeah, you can come back another year. Or transfer somewhere else. Like I wouldn't be like Trevor Keels, man. Pack up and go somewhere else and, and yeah, go right. be the guy exactly. on maybe a slightly lesser named team. Right. And yeah, I don't know. I just would be really bummed because this is a kid that like we've talked about ad nauseum. He has the, the physical goods. He just needs some time. And most 18 year olds do. He could still be growing for all we know. Right. And it's not of, his yeah. it's not his fault. It's the idiot no, who put him at 17th overall. <laughs> and they obviously haven't watched him play. Yeah. Now, in the defense of all those people that I have blatantly called out, I understand that he has now been removed from most first rounders after his not so great combine show. Oh, but y'all had him there. He was yeah, you there. all had him there. And and if you just took the time to actually watch a guy instead of like, you know, making believe you're a draft person, you know, that's what real draft people do. They actually watch basketball players play. <laughs> yeah. It just pisses me off, you know? I, yeah, no, I agree. Oh, right. he's tall. Oh, well, in a league where the average height is 6'6", six, six, I'm shocked that he's tall. <laughs> Would have never guessed. And he's long with, a, <laughs> with the average wingspan is plus five. Yeah. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So, so we'll move on to our guest. It's time to bring on our special guest for this week, Marco Zarakovic, the head coach of Tel Telecom Baskets Bonn 2 in Germany. Welcome, Marco. How are you doing tonight? Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be with you. I'm doing great. It was a long day, but I'm happy to be here with you. Okay. Um, so I know the, the German B BBL is structured in three, three levels, you know, the top division and then A and B, but your team is, is fits in somewhere else. Could you explain how um, Bond 2, how you, how you relate to the, to the main club? And um, and basically how you relate to you know the top level A B and, and A, A and B the A and B levels. Yeah, correct. Uh, there are three levels, three main levels, and after that it's something which is called the uh, regional leagues. So basically, uh, we it, the fourth league is the regional league which we are playing, and the main difference is that costs of playing that league are lower because you don't travel that much and uh, it's kind of easier to organize it you don't have to play in some special big gym or something like that and at the end it costs less money to the club to be there and because we are playing with uh, a lot of young guys because we are something like to U.S. terms, we would be something like G League team of some NBA team, you know, like some sister team or farm team, which is the uh, main goal of the team is to develop young players. So we are like in my team, we have some guys had this season who are 15 years old, German national team players who are playing with adults. And the, these regional leagues are usually full of uh, players who are like that, not physically and mentally strong enough to play at the higher level. Or there is a lot of veterans who are finishing their careers and who are just taking it easy at the level which is not so physically and mentally demanding. Right. So that, that is how it looks. And in our region, which is somewhere like central Germany, there is really a lot of um, ex-pro players and future young stars. So it's it's okay for our young guys to be at that level. L let me ask you this. Um, do, do, am, I, am I correct? Because I know like in Spain, you know, there's like uh, Barca 1, you know, the Barca main team, and then they have Barca 2. Is there any of that in Germany where, where does like like Berlin or... Or any of those teams, do they have a smaller team playing in A or B? Uh, yes, some teams, uh, nobody has a team playing in A, but some of the teams have teams playing in B. And then uh, uh, depends. It, sometimes that team is not going to be called like, I don't know, Bayern Munich 2 or something like that. They will have some other name, but they will basically be the farm team of that big team. 
so okay. that exists also. Let's say that maybe half of the teams have a team in Pro B, third level, and others are in the regional league like, like us also. So it depends from the club's idea where they want to be and how to, to keep working with the young guys. And of course, financial situation dictates a lot. Like, of course. can you play at that level or not? What is what is the main difference? I mean, A and B would sound like A is harder than B. Um, it's 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 a better league, but is there is B like mostly for young ki- young guys and A more for uh, more established people? Well, that's one way to look at the leagues. The main difference is in like rules that in uh, B there can be only one import player, ah. and in A I think you can sign four of them or some three or four something like that. I'm not sure. Uh, so uh, first of all, that that's the big difference, you know, because even if you have some better financial situation, you have to sign German players and to develop them when you are in B. And that is why most nobody from the big teams is having a team in A. They are all playing B because they are playing with their German guys, you know. And uh, and like you said, obviously when you go to A, you have ambition to try to go to the Bundesliga and then it's a bit higher level. There is more US and other import players who are also higher level. So that, that makes a difference. But this is more like for the German guys. And A is already like when you're trying to, to achieve some higher goals and to get to the highest level. Okay. All right. I'm going to pass it off to Drew for the next question. Hey, Marco. Thanks for taking the time to stop by and chat with us. I know it's probably really late for you. Um, yeah. Rich and I were talking about this prior. and Germany seems to have become a really popular destination for undrafted college players from the States. And we just kind of wanted to get your feelings on why Germany has become so popular. And, and do you think more guys should look to play overseas, particularly in Germany, instead of maybe going down to the G League here in the States? Yeah, Germany is becoming more and more popular, especially to U.S. players. Well, uh, I think the main reason is that clubs are very well organized and that league, compared to some other European leagues, it has more of freestyle game, which is suited for the U.S. players. It's not so strict by the rules and teams are not playing some old-fashioned way. They are really trying to be modern. And on the other hand, uh, it's top-level top level organizations. Teams are not having financial problems usually. And there is a lot of teams which are very competitive. So league is very interesting, you know, like there is a lot of options for the guys who are under the radar to maybe play there one more one year for some lower level team and then really to be seen and to go to the higher level which is what happened to a lot of players so i think that are the benefits and i mean if the player gets a chance to play to really have minutes then he should take that chance germany or not germany that that's my opinion you know if you are sitting on the bench of the best team simply you're not going to get better, you know. So I think it's always a good for the guys who need minutes to come and to show their skills, to see something new, to to learn some new things, and then to go back to the higher level. And many of them are using that. I, I actually uh, know one of the players on your main squad, Tyson Ward. Um, yeah. And uh, also know somebody on MHP. I actually know Jonah Radenbaugh pretty well. And I know Jonah's really had some good success there. I think they finished third in the uh, Champions League. And they're now in the final four. I, the last time I checked, though, I think they're down 0-2 to Berlin. Oh, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, yeah. But um, we, we, <laughs> I, I had I had a discussion, and, and I'm getting off the script here, but I had a discussion with a Spanish coach, and I asked him about uh, 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 Jean Montanero, a Dominican player who played in Spain last year, and yeah. I said 
I, I asked him flat out, I said, why, why did Montanero go to overtime elite, which is basically a high school league, after he, you know, he had a chance to get called up to the ACB. And he said, simply put, he would make 40000 here in Spain, and overtime elite was promising at least 100000 So my question, though, is, is can it, can the BBL, the top, can the top league be competitive salary wise with the G League? Because I know the G League, G League pays doesn't pay as well as overtime elite. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, o- overtime elite is something new and something special. Uh, but uh, yes, BBL teams have a good budget and they can pay a good money. Now, obviously, it all depends. If you are a rookie, like everywhere, you are going not going to get some top contract. But let's say if you play a year or two of good basketball in Germany, probably your next contract is going to be significantly better than in Gili. Okay. All right. Back to my scheduled question, which was, you know, as, as I talk to international guys like yourself, coaches, scouts, you know, they always tell me, uh, you know, a lot of times they take shots at other leagues. Like uh, I give an uh, give example of... Um, uh, Bassan, uh, Hugo Bassan, who went from France to uh, Australia, and I asked a French guy, "Why did Why did he go to Australia?" He goes, "Because because they don't play defense in Australia." <laughs> 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 but uh, uh, so basically, you know, when we're talking about the the very top leagues, would you do they have different personalities? Uh, I mean, or are they just, is it the same type of ball, but just maybe just a little different levels? So, for example, is playing in the Adriatic League the same as playing in Germany, uh, as, it, as the same as it is playing in France or is in Spain? Well, it's, it's a tough question, and I don't want, don't want to generalize the things, you know, like, because... Let, at every level, if you look at the NBA, there are teams who are playing this way and there are teams who are playing that way. So can you say that it would be the same if you are playing, I don't know, in Golden State Warriors or San Antonio Spurs? It's completely style-wise, probably different experience, you know. Right, it's, right. The same, it's the same in Europe. You have like, you have the teams who are playing faster, you have the teams who are playing slower, and it depends always from the coach, you know. So, yeah, there, there are some generalities, but it, it will happen that, for example, I don't know, Adriatic League this year looks one way and the next could be completely different because, I don't know, maybe there will be more money or different type of players and then, the, like, like everywhere in the world, coaches will just try to win and they will do whatever it takes to win, you know. So right. I, I really don't like that kind of generalizations. Like in Spain, it's like this. In, in Germany, like that. Adriatic League is this. There are some, some things, for example, if we are talking about Adriatic League, teams in that region don't have money like teams in other places, for example, here in Germany. So a lot of times they will give a chance to young players. So you will see more young players playing there simply because the teams understand that that's one way how they can get to some kind of financial security. If they produce a guy who will go to the top level, EuroLeague or NBA, they will get, get some money back and they are more willing to invest in him because they can not sign a top player. Adriatic League teams can't compete with Real Madrid or Barcelona for the signature of some be- some of the best players, you know. So they have to, they need to have different approach. That's right. the difference. Now the style style of the play, I mean, basketball has became a global thing, you know. So like like I said, in NBA you will see different styles. Yes, there are some some things that are similar, but a lot of coaches. I mean, like. We are watching the playoffs now, like, look at the Boston style and look at the style of the teams who are more offensively oriented, you know, like, but would would Boston be successful if they are not playing the defense they are? Probably not, you know, so, like, they are doing with the team they have the, the best possible job. So, I think it's everywhere like that. So, I really don't like that generalizations, you know, like, 
because you always find a team, I don't know, they say this league or that league, they play slow, old fashion and shows up some team and some coach who are like pushing up tempo and they are successful and and it works, you know, so it's hard to make that kind of, I don't know, I don't like that kind of generalization. I, I understand, you know? I understand. Totally. Go ahead, Drew. Mm, yeah. Sorry, Marco. So correct me if I'm wrong, but you are you are Serbian, right? You're from Serbia. Yeah. So Serbia has a really strong uh, handful of players in the NBA right now. And obviously Jokic um, getting a second MVP has kind of really helped put Serbian basketball on the map. I'm a, I'm a really big Jokic fan myself. I was just kind of curious how popular is basketball in Serbia with more players, you know, coming into the league. And like you said, basketball is becoming more international. No, basketball was always in Serbia the sport number one. We are definitely basketball country. Basketball is kind of religion in my country, you know, because there is a lot of success throughout the history, even before when it was Yugoslavia, the bigger country. Basketball is very, very much loved. And uh, like if you go on the street and ask any kind of basketball question, every person, young, all men or women will have their opinion, you know, like it, it, it's unbelievable, you know people really know the game, people really, really like the game and the game has a lot of history in our country and it's definitely sport number one uh, Picking up on that um, uh, Serbia has a ton of good players in Europe, uh, speaking in like the reigning or uh, actually last year's uh, MVP Euro League MVP uh, Vasily um, Mikic. Is that how you say it? Mikic? Mikic. And uh, um, so, uh, however, we have the World Cup coming up next year. Uh, Spain and U.S. have dominated it you know, since 2002. I know in the Olympics, you guys had injury problems and uh, Jokic, uh, you know, was kind of exhausted after the season and do you think you're going to be able to put together a unit? And and uh, I, I I said I said before the Olympics, before everybody pulled out, I'm like, it's going to come down to the United States and Serbia. But obviously, <laughs> that, that well, you know, all your guys pulled out. Uh, I think even Mikic pulled out, I believe, didn't he? Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. So if do you think you're going to be able to get a full squad together next year for the World Cup? And if you do, how far do you think it can go? I think it's impossible to say, you know, like it will depend a lot from what kind of season will Jokic have, what kind of season will have the other guys because the, the, the schedules are crazy and these guys are really playing too many games, especially if they get far with their teams in the playoffs or something like that. It's really exhausting and I don't know. I'm sure that if all our best players are playing, we can win a medal and we can compete with anybody. Like we have a good enough team who can who can play even with the US, I believe. But will that happen? It's almost um, impossible to say. Well, I'll tell you something encouraging for you guys is it doesn't start till like uh, late August. It runs mm -hmm. from like uh, the last week in August to like the first week in September. So I mean, there's going to be a lot of downtime for everybody. So um, I'm hoping that we have, you know, a lot of, because France obviously is going to be, be good again. Uh, Spain's always there. Um, all right, I'm going to pass it over to Drew. Yeah, Marco, so obviously Rich and I do a lot of work, you know, with draft prospects and scouting guys all over the world. And I would say this year it seems like it might be a bit of a down year for NBA prospects playing in Germany. Um, would you say that, uh, I hope I pronounced their name right, uh, Justus Hollitz and Fedor Zuyic are the best BBL players in the current draft class? And do you think they're going to end up staying or do you think they might pull their names out? Uh, yes, I would agree that they are two most promising players. And uh, again, Zuyic is uh, from Montenegro, which is like, again, old Yugoslavia. So one more guy who is coming from that right. basketball school who is interesting and Holic signed yesterday for Lugo Brelgan in Spain. I don't okay. know if, did you get that information. So I am quite sure that he will like he will continue his career in Europe. I mean he will but I'm not sure he will go out on, on red. I think he'll just quit 
and focus on his uh, ACB season so that he has a better chances next year. And about Zhugic, probably I think he's physically very good and I think he has a chance. But let's see, he had a quite good season in Ulm. And uh, he's, um, that's the team where Killian Hayes from the Pistons started and he's trying to follow the similar path, so we'll see. Which of, uh, of the, you know, uh, I'd, I'd say overall, not just in Germany, it's probably a little bit of a down year for the European Europeans in, in this draft class are international players. Uh, um, are there any that you particularly like uh, coming out um, and see having a, a solid NBA careers eventually? Uh, I think there is, I, first of all, I agree with you. And I think that's the COVID effect because it's, it simply stopped the basketball everywhere and especially in Europe for a quite long time. And that affected many players and their decision making after that. Uh, from the guys I like, let's let's say I'm Serbian, so I will go with the Serbian guy Jovic, mm-hmm. who is who is like uh, playing in the same team where Jokic started, and he had a really good season in the Adriatic League. I think he's athletic enough and smart enough to play at the highest level. Uh, he has shown really good potential, and I would pay attention to him definitely. He is, in in my eyes, he's very interesting prospect who can cover multiple positions, who can uh, who can be like some modern NBA player. Right. And he is like, yes, you know him, but he is not like considered one of the top top prospects who is going to finish. I don't know him in somewhere in top 10 or in draft or something like that. So he's going to be one more guy who will go somewhere under the radar. And if he gets a bit of luck, like Jokic did with Nuggets, I think he really has a chance to become a solid player. Okay. All right. We got one last question for you, Marco. And I want you to settle this debate once and for all. If, if there was a street fight between the Morris twins and the Jokic brothers, who wins the fight? The Jokic brothers, of course. <laughs> Come on, Rich, Jokic brothers. <laughs> I'm, I'm, I'm putting it out there. The Jokic brothers That's would, easy. would win. Come on. That's easy. Marco's right. It's too easy. <laughs> I think the Morris twins are fake tough guys. Fake tough guys. <laughs> that's, what, that's what the Jokic brothers said. <laughs> <laughs> uh, no, right. they, they, they are Serbians. They grew up on the street, so they know a lot about about street fighting. I'm sure about that. Yes, I think one of them is actually one of them actually is a semi pro or a professional uh, MMA fighter. Yeah, right. Yeah, right. yeah, yeah. yeah. semi pro yeah. MMA fighter, I believe. Yeah. So I'd like to thank uh, Marco for joining us. Uh, it's been a lot of fun, and um, we hope to have you back uh, soon, or at least you know next year when we get another European season going on. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. Thank you. I enjoyed it a lot. And now it's time for our mailbag, and we oh, have a couple of questions for this week. Uh, the first one is from Bob, and this one you I think you should handle, and he wants to know as if we would know. Why does Charles Barkley hate San Francisco? Oh, man. Okay, well, okay. I'll, I'll be the first to admit that um, as a native to the Bay Area, born and raised here 25 years, um, I understand because I get frustrated with my own city as well. Uh, San Francisco is a great city, represents a lot of great things, has a great history, great sports, all that. The problem is, is with a combination of the tech boom, and um, it, it's definitely a more liberal city. A lot of people have transplanted here and have taken the romanticized version of San Francisco in their head and have tried to force that into what the city actually is. And, and, you know, it's, it's not a big, it's a big city, but everything in San Francisco is shut by eight o'clock. Um, everything in San Francisco, for the most part, once you get off of maybe market street, which is our main street is residential. So this is not a city you come to uh, a la New York or in LA where you're out at bars and restaurants till midnight, there's clubs open Nope, not not at all. This city is seven miles by seven miles for the most part. Most of that is residential, and the parts that aren't, they shut down at eight, maybe nine if you're lucky. And 
even if you do find a bar that's open, it's like $40 for a beer because we live in the tech center of the world. That's an exaggeration, folks. But still, $12 for a Corona is criminal. So I, I can understand why somebody visiting... Uh, a la Charles Barkley. Is that why he would, was? Is, I, 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 is that? Why oh, he, I have no idea. He uh, probably, I, I, I have no idea why he himself hates the city, but I can understand why he would. Um, okay. As a native, I am, you know, I'm not above admitting that we have a lot of problems. Not to mention, there's. If you want to get political, we've got homelessness and other issues as well. So, beautiful city, but uh, we are not the sunny Golden Gate Bridge. We're usually foggy, cold, and uh, everyone's in bed by nine thirty. Wow, I did not know that. I didn't. I, I've been to San Francisco just once. I uh, spent a few days there. Uh, I'm being a little harsh, but right. but uh, it's, it's it's not. I, don't, I actually don't night. remember going out at night. Now that I think yep. about it, um, it's 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 just people think of it as you know you got San Francisco and LA on the west, and you've got Boston and New York on the east, and it is very far removed from those cities, both just size wise, like it's just not that big, and landscape wise, like a, a big part of San Francisco is houses and parks. Um, residential right right all right and the last question before we uh, wrap up this is also a uh, somewhat serious question and this is from ty and he wants to know what our opinion is on all the charge calls because it seems like it seems like the more and more you watch uh I'm filling in the blanks here, but I'm thinking what he's thinking. I don't know. It just seems like there's, there's just like this wave of charge calls and they get them wrong almost as All much the as they get them right. Yeah. Uh, it, it is, is, I, I think that's what he's trying to say. Um, I, I think uh, it goes back to the NBA's effort, their concerted effort at the start of the season to try to, you know, for a long time, the complaint has been, it's all these dribble, dribble, step back, is out of travel, throwing their bodies into people. It, it, the game is getting soft. It's just, it's a three-point shooting contest. So I think they're trying to inject a little bit more of that physic, physicality back into the game where offensive players can't do whatever they want and physically manipulate defenders so much. The thing that sucks, though, is that a lot of times it seems like the calls are a little bit off. Or in, in my opinion, if you want to inject some physicality to the game, don't try to go the reverse and, and make it so that offensive players have to be more cautious. Maybe a few more no calls in a game wouldn't hurt. A few more, hey, when you have a 6'8 and a 6'8 man who can both have a 40-inch vertical and they jump and meet in the air, of course people are going to get hurt and bodies are going to fly and elbows are going to – it's just it's just, it's going to happen. Um, that's just my take on it. I think they're trying to swing back the pendulum a little bit from the super, you know, James Harden, Trey Young, you know, throwing their butts into people and taking four steps to shoot a jumper. And I think they've got it a little bit wrong. Like, hey, sometimes just let them play. Right, right. Um, I definitely am seeing too many of these calls. I'd like to see some be no calls. Uh, and I'd also like to see them get, there was a bad one last night. I think it was, yeah. I think it was called on Miami. And the defender was definitely giving way. He was right in front of the guy and he was giving way. The offensive guy initiated the contact and they called blocking. I'm like, the guy's giving ground. How can you call blocking? Yeah. <laughs> Well, the offensive player didn't punch him in the nose and then throw the ball off of his head. So, you know, perhaps you know, And, was, and you, you throw know. that in with all the faking, you know, all the... Um, oh, the flopping is such a problem. flopping, yeah. And it's just, it's just becomes this annoying mess. I felt yeah. that was part of the problem with the game last night. There was just like, there was a lot of contact and it didn't seem like they were calling, you know, they were willy-nilly about how they called it. And yeah, yeah. But Yeah, uh, I mean, I know that, um, I think it was James Worthy made the comment, it was James Worthy, made the comment that nowadays NBA players only practice getting tattoos and shooting threes. <laughs> and uh, it's something along those lines. And while I'm not so much the sense where I think the three ball has become a massive issue, and it's, it's I do think, actually, I, I would go as far as to say I'm, I'm pretty confident that the three ball has turned basketball into a glorified three-point shooting contest most of the time. I mean, you look at the Mavs series, and there's, I mean, Reggie Bullock is oh, just launching threes. I'm like, dude, you're not hitting. Pump fake, one dribble, pull up, get a rhythm shot, attack the basket. I mean, Davis Bertans went, what, I think four games before he attempted a two or like made a two point shot or something. And, yeah, you know, yeah. I, I, I'm not saying you have to be. Yeah, it was like game three or four was his yeah. first. You don't have to be DeMar DeRozan. You don't have to be Kobe Bryant or Michael Jordan in the post shooting followers. But it does make the product a little hard to watch. And I think it's part of the reason why this year, in particular, we saw so many blowouts because the games are being refereed a little bit tighter. But everyone's still just hucking threes the whole time. 
like I, I it's 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 kind of annoying. I mean, yeah. as a Warriors oh. fan, I can be the first to attest that when Steph's hitting, you know, threes, not looking and shimming, it's fun. But when Steph is shooting thirty-five foot shots, and you're just like, dude, oh my god, they're not even, def- they're not even like, they're, dude, what are you doing? It's one on three, <laughs> and you're shooting a forty-foot jumper. What what are you doing? So it goes both ways. Um, <laughs> the, the NBA like is a great product. You sound but. like someone's Jewish mother. Hey <laughs> man, holding your head. <laughs> Because I'm telling you, there will be a game in this. I'm telling you, Boy in this final series, there is going to be a game where the Warriors are like it's gonna be like a three point game either way, and there's gonna be a minute left on the clock, and Steph's gonna come down behind the back, step back, launch a thirty footer, clank it off the side of the rim, out of bounds. Then he's gonna come down, do the same thing, and make it, and all is gonna be forgiven. And I'm like, okay, guys, we do realize that this man just threw it off the backboard, but. Enough, enough about enough about my aversion to the three ball. All righty. So we're going to wrap it up, folks. Uh, please keep on sending your questions to admin at hoopsprospects.com. I want to thank our special guest, Marco Zarkovic, uh, for coming on the show. And I also want to thank all of you listeners. Uh, make sure to join us next week as we will be breaking down this draft in terms of the best athletes, the best shooters, best defenders, and so on. And as always, we will be joined by a special guest who will remain secret for now. For those of you who watch the Combine, Drew Timmy, best shooter possibly. Are we looking at Drew Timmy as a <laughs> yeah, best shooter? Yeah, I thought you were going to talk about Drew. You didn't <laughs> I know. Him in I know. I'll, I'll save it for our best shooter segment, Rich. That's where he's at now. <laughs> All right. He, lo- he looks like Dirk. <laughs> That's a wrap, man.